In July 2010, one man declared war on the Northumbria police force. You don't want me to kill myself, but I'm going to give you a chance because I am going for officers now. After being released from prison, 37-year-old Raoul Moat shot his ex-girlfriend, killed her new partner, and critically injured a police officer, shooting him at point-blank range. Moat rang the, the 999 system again and just basically asked Northumbria police, do you believe me now? I've just downed one of your guys. The search for Raoul Moat had become the biggest news story in the country. People were following every move of this, and during that week of the manhunt, people had their televisions and their radios switched on around the clock. After a dramatic standoff with police aired live on British television, Moat turned the shotgun on himself and pulled the trigger. He wanted to be iconic, he wanted to be infamous, he wanted to go out with a bang and not a whimper. In just seven days, Raoul Moat had etched his name in history as one of the world's most evil killers. It was a new story that gripped the nation. In the early hours of Saturday, the 10th of July, 2010, 37-year-old Raoul Moat shot himself after a six-hour standoff with Northumbria police. One of the biggest manhunts in UK history had come to a dramatic end. Moat had been on the run for seven days after critically injuring his former girlfriend and killing her new boyfriend he'd gone on to declare war on the police and shot a uniformed officer. Moat was armed, full of rage, and extremely dangerous. Jim Napier was the senior investigating officer at Northumbria Police. It was clear that his intention was wider than just targeting his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend. He was, in his words, now targeting police officers. Therefore, it was clearly the risk and the threat had gone up quite significantly. More armed officers had to be brought to the area to support the hunt to find an arrest Moat, because that's all we ever wanted to do, was find and arrest him and bring him to justice. He's making a lot of threats. He's saying, this is it. You've taken my life. I'm going to take yours. It's this real vendetta against the police. He's basically saying, I'm doing this because I'm entitled to. You better take me seriously. Former Sky News anchor Jeremy Thompson was following the story as it unfolded. It was a July day, the start of summer, and not a lot of other stories around. So one story can suddenly take hold and dominate the news agenda. So without much else around, every news outfit in the country sent their best resources up to the Newcastle area to find out more about this story and to find out more about the man that the police believe was behind it all, Raoul Moat. And this killer story begins in 1973. Raoul Moat was born on the 17th of June in Gateshead in the northeast of England. He was raised largely by his grandmother. Um, his mother had some mental health issues, but she lived in the, the local area, so, so he did have some contact with her. Um, but it wasn't anything really out of the ordinary. A, a lot of families have to cope with that kind of thing. During the 1970s and 80s, the northeast of England was an area in economic decline. Its traditional heavy industries, such as shipbuilding and mining, were phased out, and many men lost their jobs. It wasn't a particularly economically prosperous area, so it was always going to be a challenge for Moat to find his way in the world as a man. Many teenagers go through a lot of changes, particularly at momentous points in their teenage years. 
When Moat was 16, he left school and there were some changes in him around about that time. So he became quite fixated on bodybuilding. And this is something that you often find with young working class lads in an area where the prospects of those, those traditional kind of tough men's jobs are few and far between. They look to other ways to, to become men, to make themselves visibly masculine. And I think that was what Moat was doing. When you see the results, then in, in anything, you, you get more, oh wow, this is working. So then he went in more and more, and then he started getting into steroids. It was clear that Moat had had some serious psychiatric problems growing up, and he'd obviously decided to express himself as the big fella around town. He was six foot three, 17 stone, and liked this idea of being a large, well built, muscle bodybuilder, and he clearly used a lot of steroids. And, People who were close to him talked time and time again about just what a terrible temper he'd got. Moat was somebody who has what I would describe as poor behavioural control. So somebody who flies off the handle quite easily, somebody who's quite readily aggravated. And if you throw steroids into the mix, you, you get what people often refer to as roid rage, you know, a real inability to control your temper. And it increases the levels of testosterone in the body. So when somebody has a predilection towards aggression, and then you add that on top of it, you've got a really toxic mix. Moat had found work as a tree surgeon, and his physical appearance came in handy in his other role as a nightclub doorman. By 2005, the 32-year-old was caught by the police carrying a knuckle duster and a samurai sword. He'd fallen foul of the law on numerous occasions. He was known to the police for incidents uh, of domestic abuse. He had a number of partners with which he had troubled relationships with and the police were involved. He had had arrests for, generally speaking, uh, low-level violence. By 2010, 37-year-old Moat had fathered several children with different partners. His latest girlfriend, Samantha, was 15 years his junior. They'd been in an on and off relationship for six years and had a daughter together. Well, the relationship between Samantha and Moat was an incredibly controlling one. It's one that I classify as coercively controlling. So Moat believed that Samantha was his possession. He was in control, he decided what happened, and she basically had to suck it up and get on with it. So it was his rules. Um, everything was, was focused around him and he would control everything. He would control her movements, um, what she could buy, could not buy, what she did, you know, who she talked to on the phone. So obviously Samantha would probably feel like completely controlled. She didn't have the right to do anything. You often find in relationships like this, women are kind of treading on eggshells, trying not to upset their abusive partner. But at the same time, it's very, very difficult for them to leave. Often looking from the outside, we say, well, why are you staying in this relationship? And often it's to keep themselves safe because they know that if they were to leave, they'd put themselves in quite a significant amount of danger. Samantha was desperate to leave Raoul Moat, and in the spring of 2010, a chance presented itself. Moat was convicted of assaulting a family member and sentenced to 18 weeks in Durham prison, something that only aggravated him further. I am not a psychologist, but it was clear to me that Moat was a bit of a psychopath. He was always willing to blame others for everything that he did wrong. Everybody else was responsible. The social services were wrong. His legal team were wrong because they gave him bad advice and the police were picking on him. He's always laying the blame at somebody else's door because he doesn't think that he can do anything wrong and that's a classic trait of somebody who's narcissistic. Raoul Moat was locked away, but he was a man holding a grudge and wanted revenge. For the past six years, he'd been in an on and off relationship with his 22-year-old girlfriend, Samantha. 
Moat being in prison had a significant impact on his relationship with Samantha. For a man like Moat, it's very, very important to be in control all of the time, especially in terms of your personal relationships. When he's removed from that domestic picture, he has to try really hard to, to keep control. So he's on the phone to Samantha quite a lot. He has one of his friends essentially stalking her and checking what she's up to. While Moat was in prison, Samantha did keep in contact with him. She had a daughter to him, uh, and she kept in touch with him for the sake of that child. Samantha tried to convince Moat over the phone that it was over, but any talk of separation fell on deaf ears. She was probably scared of him. You'd be scared if you have, you know, a man that big saying, I am the man, and if you don't do what I tell you, you know, you're gonna get hurt or something. So she didn't know how to escape. So him being put in prison to her was like, whew, you know, something helped her out here. You no, know, she finally was away from him. But the problem was Sam knew he was coming back. In his mind, the relationship wasn't over. Uh, in his mind, they were going to reconcile, but she didn't uh, have that plan at all. And, uh, and, and the, the sort of straw that appears to have broken the camel's back was her announcing the fact that she was in a new relationship with uh, Christopher Brown. Christopher, a 29-year-old karate instructor originally from Berkshire, moved to Newcastle in October 2009. He met Samantha in June 2010, whilst Moat was still in prison. Christopher's mother, Sally, was unaware of their relationship. As far as I know, Sam and Christopher only met each other a couple of weeks. They hadn't been going out with each other for very long at all. Christopher went up to Newcastle. He said he was going for the weekend. I said, OK, fine. And then I got a phone call sort of like a few days later, and he said, well, Mum, I've got a chance to work here with Karate. I'm going to stay. I said, didn't like it, but OK, fine. And that was it. He's, he seemed to settle down. He loved what he was doing. Samantha had told Moat that her new boyfriend was a police officer. Christopher was never a police officer, never. He was a karate instructor. Um, never even thought of joining the police force. So I think she was just trying to back Moat off. So I think that must be the only reason she told him that. She lied to Moat because she was afraid of Moat. And she knew that when he came out, he would have gone to her and to the new boyfriend. So she started saying that he was a police officer, because that wouldn't intimidate people. She also said that he was a karate instructor of a black belt in karate. Periods of separation are a really high risk time for people who've just come out of an abusive relationship because the abuser has essentially lost control at this point in time. The victim has taken some power back and, and has some, some authority now over their own lives and the abuser hates that and they're gonna resort to quite drastic measures to get that control back. So the only thing he had to look forward to is going back to Sam, to the person he loved. And then she took that away from him. Right. And that would just like completely bring his anger to surface like crazy. There's no doubt at all that, that those conversations while Moat was in Durham prison were the blue touch papers that ignited the bonfire that became Raoul Moat. Moat's anger was uncontrollable. He decided he was going to kill Christopher Brown as soon as he got out of jail. He enlisted the help of a friend, Carl Ness. Moat started planning this while he was in prison. He recruited or he used Carl Ness to keep an eye on Samantha and do what, is a, what we would call surveillance by watching a house, seeing who comes and goes, identifying vehicles, and trying to identify who the new boyfriend was. On Thursday, the 1st of July, 2010, 37-year-old Raoul Moat was released from prison. He didn't waste any time. It's alleged that Carl Ness had found a shotgun for him to use. The way in which Moat planned this was quite meticulous. He took steps to try and identify the, 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 the karate instructor, i.e. Christopher, by making phone calls to, to health centres, to karate clubs, to, um, to the extent that he actually drove around the routes 
that they took on the fatal night. Uh, they actually had a, a, a dry run, if you like, on the Thursday night. On Friday the 2nd of July, staff at Durham Prison warn Northumbria police that Moat might pose a risk to Samantha. But, unfortunately, the information wasn't acted upon. The same day, Moat was captured on CCTV in Newcastle, sporting a Mohican hairstyle. Later that night, Carl Ness drove Moat to nearby Gateshead, where Samantha and Christopher were at a house party. Moat was dropped off quite near the address that Samantha and Christopher were visiting, and he was able to walk in there and hide himself uh, underneath the front window next to the front door, where he was able to listen because it was a July night, the window was open, it was warm. He could hear people talking and, and saying things, and he picked up on things that were being said about him or things that he perceived to be about him. And he started texting his friend Ness and, and expressing his anger and frustration at what he was hearing. This is going on, it's really annoying me. He's essentially venting. And this is something that you see narcissistic people do quite a lot. They want an audience for their complaints and their rants. They want validation. They want other people to agree with them and say, yeah, you're completely reasonable. Moat lay in wait outside the house. Around about 2.30 in the morning, Samantha and Christopher leave. And as they come out the front door, Moat stood up. He was clearly armed with a gun and, and pretty much without warning, he immediately shot Christopher. Christopher started trying to run away and as he tried to run across the grass area, he was shot again, which was enough to make him fall. Moat then calmly walked over, reloaded his gun uh, in front of witnesses and then shot him a third time, causing his death was nothing more than a cold and calculated assassination. It was a public execution. Moat had used a sawn-off shotgun to shoot Christopher Brown at point-blank range. Certainly with a close-range discharge of a shotgun, even with small pellets, you're going to get a large mass going into the body that's going to lacerate major organs, major blood vessels, very likely to be fatal. To create maximum damage, Moat had loaded his shotgun with lead fishing weights. They're bigger, they're heavier, they do more damage. They're going to make those discharges more lethal. Christopher had no chance of survival, but amidst the horror unfolding in front of her very eyes, Samantha had managed to run back into the house to seek refuge. After he'd shot Chris, he then turned round and walked towards the house that they'd been in. He could clearly see that Samantha was in the sitting room there, and he fired a shot at Samantha, which went through the window and struck her in the abdomen, causing her some critical injuries. So he had fatally wounded one victim, he had critically injured a second victim, and then he calmly walked away from the scene. Moat had no idea whether he'd killed Samantha or not. Well, most people, when they commit a murder, they are absolutely horrified at what they've done. They can't quite believe that the magnitude of it, they often go into a state of, of shock and, and literally don't know what they're doing afterwards. But Moat was very calm, he was very calculated. He phoned his friend, he said, I'm full of beans. And the reason for that was because he thought he'd restored the natural order of things. He felt entitled to carry out those shootings. Moat had casually left the scene armed with his shotgun. For him, it seemed to have been a bit like mission accomplished and, and, he, and he seemed quite calm and pleased with himself. But he would not remain calm for long. Raoul Moat had killed Christopher Brown and critically injured Samantha in front of other party guests. The police were searching for the 37-year-old, but he was one step ahead. Moat had left a letter with a friend to deliver to detectives later in the day. It warned the police would pay for what they've done. 
He had a 49 page letter that he'd written outlining his complaints about various things. And you often see this with people who are narcissistic. When they have a complaint, when they're angry about something, it's not enough for them to just make a concise statement and, and sum it up neatly. They will go on and on and on. And in these, these statements and, and these letters, they'll be saying, you know, this is, this is all about victimizing me. I'm the victim here. Everybody's out to get me. And it goes on, it's embellished, it's exaggerated. He's a classic narcissist. The same day, 300 miles away in Berkshire, uniformed officers paid a visit to Sally Brown, the mother of murdered 29-year-old karate instructor, Christopher. It was our local police that came around to me. They just said that there'd been an incident and that Christopher was dead. But then um, I had the family liaison officer from Newcastle on the phone. And they didn't tell me too much over the phone. I think it was a case of I wasn't listening anyway. All I heard was, your son's dead. That was it. It's, it you seem to sort of cut everything else off. And when, it, when you're told something like this, you, I think your body and your brain just goes into um, how can I describe it? You're hearing people, they're talking to you. And at the time, I was at home, I was listening to these people on the phone. And I was talking to the police officers at the house with me. But I could also hear my daughter screaming in the background. She's absolutely gone hysterical. He was a lad, he was a typical little boy. He was just very happy, laughing all the time. And he would help anybody if he could. He wouldn't let anyone get hurt. He was just a nice lad. But then I'm biased, I suppose, because <laughs> he's my boy. <laughs> when you lose one of your children, you just can't describe it. Can't describe it. It's horrendous. While the Brown family mourned, Raoul Moat was still on the run. His hatred towards the police was rising. Samantha had told Moat that Christopher Brown worked for them. I think he was on the understanding Christopher was a police officer because Sam had gone in and told him that he was a police officer. Christopher has never been in the police force. He's a karate instructor, and whether she thought telling him that he was would back him off a bit, I don't know. Moat's hostility towards the police was turning into a vendetta, and he was keen for them to know who they were dealing with. In the early hours of Sunday the 4th of July, after being on the run for 24 hours, Moat dialed 999. This is the gunman from Berkeley last night. Uh, my name is Raoul Moat. What I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done. Right? Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back with one of your officers, this gentleman that I shot last night, the Claudia instructor, right? Now, you bastards, you bastards have been on to me, right, for years. He's have hassled us, harassed us, he has just won't leave us alone. He was wanting me to do myself in, and I was going to do it until I found out about him properly and what was going on. And as soon as I found out his officer, I thought, no, nah, you've had too much from me. You've had too much from me. You'll get your chance to kill us, right? You'll get your chance to kill us, no, okay? We, we don't want to do that. We don't oh, want to do, do that. You don't want me to kill myself, but I'm going to give you a chance because I am going for officers now. Raoul Moat spent a number of minutes ranting on the phone, effectively declaring war on Northumbria police and saying, I'm coming to get you. You, you have ruined my life. I'm coming to get you. Essentially, he wants an audience, he wants to vent. And this call really is a, a poor me monologue. He's saying to the operator, this is all your fault, you being the police. You've done this to me. It's all about him. It's saying, these are the reasons why I've done what I've done, because I've been driven to it by other people. I'm not responsible. After making the 999 call, Moat had stepped up his vendetta against the police. A friend, Karam Awan, was driving him around in a black Lexus. Moat was actively hunting for police officers. Moat's two closest associates in the criminal underworld were Ness and Awan. They assisted him the moment that he left Durham prison. 
Shortly after making his threatening call to police, Moat spotted a sitting police car at a roundabout in the Denton area. Inside was 42-year-old PC David Rathband. Moats approached the car from behind, tapped on the passenger window, and David turned, and as soon as he turned, Moat shot once through the window, which hit David right in the middle of the face. He fell into the foot compartment of his car. Despite his serious condition, PC Rathband tried to activate the emergency button in his vehicle. Moat then shot him for a second time and calmly walked away. Moat was on the anger rampage. If he had passed another police officer on a motorcycle, he probably would have stopped and shot him as well. If there was a police officer in the shop, he probably would shoot him as well. It's because he only found one. If he had found more, he would have shot more. When Brown Moat shot PC David Rathband, it, it signified a real escalation in his offending. This wasn't just about Raoul Moat and people who had annoyed him. It was a callous attack. David Rathband had sustained life-threatening injuries. He had survived, but he would never see again. As a forensic pathologist, if you're told somebody has been shot at very close range in the face with a shotgun, you're expecting to perform an autopsy. That person is almost certainly dead. I think it's almost miraculous that David Rathband survived what happened to him. You can see from the x-rays the number of little pellets in him. Any one of those could easily have gone and struck something utterly vital and killed him. He's being shot in the face. Moat made yet another 999 call. He was determined to make sure the police knew it was him who'd shot the 42-year-old father of two. Within maybe an hour of that incident, Moat basically asked Northumbria police, do you believe me now? I've just downed one of your guys. And just remind colleagues in Northumbria that I'm coming to get you. And that was a big, big game, game changer in this manhunt. What appeared at first to be a domestic dispute with a fatal outcome was quickly evolving into a much bigger story with nationwide interest. Jeremy Thompson was the anchor for Sky News. Within 24 hours, policeman David Rathband had been shot in the face. A rare occurrence for a policeman to be shot in Britain. That really ramped up the story. The media poured into the Northeast very quickly. It became an unprecedented manhunt over that long, hot July week up in the Northeast of England. And the media interest was intense. People had their televisions and their radios switched on around the clock. It was a difficult time for the Brown family. I. I couldn't turn the news on because every time something came up about it, it was always Raoul Moat's photo that they were showing because he was the one that was on the run and what have you. But I just, even afterwards, I said to the police once that it seems as though Christopher was a number put under the carpet. The following day, Monday the 5th of July, it emerged that Moat had posted on his Facebook page, I've lost everything, watch and see what happens. With his behaviour becoming increasingly erratic, the authorities were warning the public not to approach him. This wasn't just about Raoul Moat and his personal issues with his relationships. This represented a real risk to the public, so the scale of this case now was, was incredibly significant. It was an operation that was supported by police forces from across the country. Colleagues from London, Liverpool, Manchester. There was equipment sent from Northern Ireland. There was a huge response to this because day-to-day -day policing had to continue in the Northumbria police area. They had to be there in numbers and they had to have the right equipment. They had to be armed. It was on an epic scale. They had not only got 160 armed officers, but also they'd got special armored vehicles. They'd got specially trained tracker dogs. They'd got helicopters up and they'd even got an RAF jet up there running reconnaissance missions over that whole area. It was an extraordinary reaction to what they knew at the time to be perhaps no more than one man with a gun on the loose. 
After shooting and blinding PC David Rathband at point blank range on Sunday, July the 4th, Moat had gone off the radar. Two shooting incidents in 24 hours and then gone. No more phone calls, no more messages. He just vanished into thin air. We did not know where he was. He had come down, caused all that damage and then disappeared. Police appealed to the gunman to turn himself in, but Moat remained on the loose, armed and extremely dangerous. On the 6th of July, the black Lexus Moat had used when he shot PC Rathband was found abandoned in the small town of Rothbury, 30 miles north of Newcastle. Police set up a two-mile exclusion zone and urged residents to stay indoors. The hunt suddenly started to focus on a very pretty market town called Rothbury, right on the edge of the Northumberland National Park, a beautiful little town on the Coquit River, surrounded by glorious but pretty remote countryside. And presumably Moat knew pretty well and felt that he could steer clear of the police around there and whatever game he had in mind, whatever he was doing to taunt the police at the time or to evade the police, he felt it was his best bet. There was still no sign of moat, but police had found an abandoned campsite in Rothbury and a dictaphone with recordings of moat complaining how unhappy he was with the media reports about his private life. He also made threats to the general public unless the stories stopped. So he's listening to what's going on um, in the media, he's following the coverage. So all of this is going to be fueling his aggravation and his, his sense of annoyance, essentially. So this is somebody who's becoming incredibly dangerous the, the more bruised their ego becomes. On Wednesday, the 7th of July 2010, police found yet another letter in a tent. It was addressed to his ex-girlfriend, Samantha. Moat was somewhere nearby, but detectives still didn't know exactly where. They offered a £10,000 reward for any information that could lead to the 37-year-old's capture. I would ask people to keep contacting either Northumbria Police or Crime Stoppers with any information they believe may be relevant. There is a £10,000 reward for information which leads to the detention of Mr Moat. The media interest in the case was intensifying with rolling 24-hour news reports. By Thursday, the 8th of July, Moat had now been on the run for five days, but the police had finally made a breakthrough. It's one of the most curious twists in this whole story that at one stage, a few days into the manhunt, police were telling us they believe that Moat was holding two hostages. But then, strangely, this story twisted round. The next thing we hear is that the police have arrested two men, Ness and a one, who they now tell us they believe were friends and aiders and abettors of the runaway man, Raoul Moat. Within 24 hours, it had gone from two hostages to two men arrested, believed to have some involvement in Moat's escape and perhaps even the shootings itself. The arrest of Moat's accomplices, 26-year-old Carl Ness and 23-year-old Karam Awan, was a mere sideshow to the manhunt around Rothbury. By now, the media had been issued with a news blackout. Not a complete blackout, but a blackout on some of the personal details that clearly they felt was stirring up Moat even more, making him even more potentially dangerous. The hunt for Raoul Moat had elevated the killer to a bizarre cult status. So for some people, Raoul Moat is an anti-hero. You know, he represents um, somebody who stands up to authority, somebody who doesn't follow the rules. And, and for some people, that's something to be admired, unfortunately. Moat's time was running out. On Friday the 9th of July, a local resident spotted a man walking next to the river in Rothbury. She approached the police patrol 
who went down to check it out. As soon as Moat saw the police vehicle, he sunk to his knees, put the gun to his head, and uh, that's when the standoff started. Some of those images will live with me forever. I can remember them vividly, live, constantly going back to seeing what was happening. Moat on his knees. That riverbank is the abiding image of Raoul Moat in almost everybody's mind. On the evening of Friday the 9th of July, the nation was glued to their television sets as the drama unfolded. But this wasn't a film, it was real life. The police were dealing with a man who was erratic, armed and extremely dangerous. We had police negotiators who were there on the scene face to face who spent the next six hours or so speaking to him and trying to persuade him that the right thing to do was put the gun down and surrender himself to custody. The police were determined to make sure that Moat came out of the standoff alive. The presence of the media added extra pressure on their performance. You're there focused on doing your job, but you're doing your job in the knowledge that there's lots of people watching you, scrutinising you, and some of them judging you. But Moat wasn't planning on giving himself up so easily, and the case continued to attract media attention. An extraordinary part of this story was the involvement of celebrities. Almost as the manhunt came to its dramatic and fatal climax, we got the almost bizarre scene of Gaza, Paul Gascoigne, famous England footballer, turning up in his dressing gown, claiming to know Raoul Moat, and offering Moat chicken and lager if he gave himself up. Didn't come to anything. The police just asked Gaza to politely leave the town and had nothing more to do with it. As the night of Friday the 9th of July turned into the early hours of Saturday, the situation remained tense. Negotiations with Moat weren't working, and he remained where he was with a gun pointed at his own head. It was an incredibly long and tense night. Darkness fell. We really could see very little of what was going on. We could just see the outlines of the police cordon. And the night dragged on after midnight into the small hours. And it was around one o'clock in the morning when there was a dramatic series of events, hard to make out. It was confused, it was dark, it was very difficult to know exactly what the sequence of events were. In one last attempt to capture Moat, the police decided to use a taser on the 37-year-old. They were determined to take him alive. On this occasion, the tasers that were used were long tasers, like shotgun-style tasers, uh, which hadn't yet been approved for use by the police. When you're in a mindset and a determination to uh, arrest somebody, to call them to account for the crimes that they've committed in the safest possible way, then it was right and proper that it was given a try. Uh, it didn't work. At approximately 1.15 a.m. on Sunday the 10th of July, the sound of a shotgun blast, followed by shouting, signalled that Raoul Moat had taken his own life. I don't think the police had any chance of talking Raoul Moat down. He wanted to be iconic, he wanted to be infamous, he wanted to go out with a bang and not a whimper. A seven-day manhunt and a six-hour standoff had come to a dramatic conclusion. He clearly had decided that he didn't want to be taken captive, he didn't want another sentence in jail again. This was it, this was his final stand, this was the moment. He decided to pack up, give up, not be taken again. With Moat dead, the police focused their attention on those who'd aided him during the seven days. 
In March 2011, at Newcastle Crown Court, Moat's two accomplices, 26-year-old Carl Ness and 23-year-old Karam Awan, were convicted of conspiracy to murder, attempted murder and armed robbery. Awan was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years, while Ness was further convicted of murder and a firearms offence and sentenced to a minimum 40 years. Awan's defence solicitor told reporters, this trial is Hamlet without the prince. They were Moat's assistants. They were, in every sense, the sorcerer's apprentice. They were there to facilitate Moat's plan, which was to become famous. He wanted his 15 minutes of celebrity, and boy, he was going to get them. In a further tragic turn, in February 2012, PC David Rathband took his own life. Unable to cope with his blindness since the shooting, he hanged himself. His colleagues at Northumbria Police believe that 44-year-old David had become Moat's second victim. David's involvement in this case, you know, he was a police officer doing his job uh, in uniform to the best of his ability and without warning, he suffered horrific injuries that changed his life and, in my view, ultimately led to his death. And I will always hold Raoul Moore responsible for killing David Rathbun. These people do these things to... and they don't think about the consequences of the people that they leave behind. They said it would get easier, but no, it gets harder. Everybody talks about the Raoul Moore case. This started as the Christopher Brown murder inquiry. My team that investigated it, it continued to be the Christopher Brown murder inquiry. The only thing he did wrong was he fell for a girl who Mo believed was his possession, and he would use any force to deal with that, and he did. Um, and we should never forget that Christopher was the first victim here. Christopher was a very happy-go-lucky, fun-loving person. He was a good son, he was a good friend to his friends, a good brother to his sister. He's never out of our thoughts. He's... I just miss him so much. Raoul Moat was full of rage when he left Durham prison on July the 1st, 2010 but no one could have imagined the lengths he would go to in order to get back at his girlfriend. His murderous rampage left an innocent man dead, executed in cold blood, his ex-girlfriend wounded and scarred for life, and a police officer blind and suicidal. All this before turning the gun on himself. His selfish lust for revenge and notoriety turned him into the most infamous man in Britain and one of the world's most evil killers. November the 13th, 1977, Los Angeles, California. Schoolgirls Dolores and Sonia were on their way home from a day's shopping when two police officers stopped them for questioning. But the so-called policemen were, in fact, killers. They fell victim to two men who knew no compassion, no remorse, no empathy. It is beyond depraved. 14-year-old Sonia and 12-year-old Dolores were abducted, held captive for five days, repeatedly raped, then strangled. Their killers were two cousins, Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi. You got the smooth talking, sharp, glib Bianchi. And then you've got the street con wise, smart predator in Bono. That's a pretty dangerous combination. The partners in crime went on a killing spree, murdering 10 young women in just four months. Many were dumped on hillsides across LA, lending the killers their infamous name, the Hillside Stranglers. These two were not going to stop until they were caught. This had a really devastating effect on the lives of women in Los Angeles. 
The deadly duo terrorized the streets of LA whilst masquerading as police officers. They raped and tortured victims as young as 12 during their sickening rampage, making Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi two of the world's most evil killers. December 14th, 1977, Los Angeles, California. On a deserted hillside overlooking the city, 17-year-old Kimberly Martin was found dead by two paperboys doing their morning rounds. Her killers had posed her body in a provocative manner. They dropped her naked body on the hills in Alessandro Drive pointing at the city hall. I think that was a deliberate placement to kind of piss everybody off, you know. Now, the media kind of went crazy about this. That's where the name Hillside Strangler came from. Kimberly was the ninth victim of the killers in barely two months. It became one of the biggest news stories of the year, spreading panic throughout the city. It created a whole lot of fear, particularly amongst women who were actually afraid to go out at night. And there was some indication from some of the investigation that whoever was perpetrating these crimes may have been impersonating a police officer. Women were concerned that if they were approached by police officers, should they stop or should they just keep moving? It was really a terrorizing period of time. In response, firearm sales went through the roof and the women of L.A. made preparations to defend themselves. Women were taking physical defense lessons, buying guns, getting stuff to prevent themselves on the street to keep from being assaulted. They're reading about it every day. It's on television every day. That's a lot of panic out there in the street, and you could sense it in the street. You really could. I think that gave Bianchi and Bono pleasure. I think they took an absolute delight in the fact that they had taken a whole community by the throat, literally, and strangled the life out of it. The story of these two killers begins in Rochester, New York. Angelo Bono was the eldest of the adoptive cousins and was born on October 5th, 1934. He and his sister were born into an Italian-American family. At the age of five, his parents divorced, and in 1939, his mother took her two children west to Glendale in Los Angeles. You could say that Bono was a troubled child. He had a very strange relationship with his mother, whom he uh, constantly accused of being a whore. Now, he doesn't speak very highly of his mother at all. His mother would go and visit men and he would have to wait outside. So here's an individual who's got very fixed ideas about who women are and how they should behave and what's acceptable for women and what isn't. And I think that feeds into the rationale behind the future offending. At the age of 16, Bono dropped out of high school and turned to crime. As a teenager, Bono was somebody who regularly broke the rules. He would steal things, he would joyride in cars, he would hang around with gangs. This is somebody who just did not think the rules applied to him. And when you look at who his role models are, they were criminals. So he's starting off on a very dangerous path. Whilst Bono was serving time in youth custody for stealing cars in 1951, his adoptive cousin, Kenneth Alessio Bianchi, was born on the 22nd of May. He too had a troubled start in life. Kenneth Bianchi, born, funnily enough, also in Rochester, New York, just like Bueno. But Bianchi's mother was a sex worker, and he was very swiftly put up for adoption as a three-month-old infant. And he was adopted by Bueno's mother's sister, He's adopted by Francis and Nicholas. Now, Francis absolutely doted on him, but she took this to a, an absolute extreme, and she had this paranoia that there was something wrong with Kenneth, and she took him to see the doctor, 
on multiple occasions when there turned out to be absolutely nothing wrong with him. And I think this kind of smothering can be just as damaging as neglect. There was something quite toxic going on here. Soon, the young Bianchi started showing worrying signs of behaviour. He was described by his adopted mother as a compulsive liar from a very, very early age. He was difficult to control. And then his father dies when he's a teenager. So the male role model is removed, and he is, to some extent, left swigging in the breeze. Despite being just 14, Bianchi's mother had big plans for the son she'd sheltered. At the funeral, she made Bianchi wear his father's shoes. They were far too big and he walked clumsily. But they were a symbol of who he had become, the man of the house. They were an Italian Catholic family with some very rigid ideas about family and about the role of men and the role of women. So we're seeing some, some quite strong values coming through in his childhood, and they're values that he draws on in an incredibly dysfunctional way. His mother recognised that he had a lot of psychiatric issues and problems, and she wouldn't let him date girls. She watched over him very, very closely. Bianchi graduated high school and, aged 18, married his sweetheart, Brenda. But his insecurities about her forging her own career as a nurse caused tension in the marriage. Bianchi saw women as something to be possessed. They could be his and his alone. The marriage to Brenda fell apart very quickly. He was only 18. He accused her of being unfaithful. It played to his sense that any woman he had to possess, he had to control completely. After just a few months, the couple divorced. Bianchi then planned a respectable career in the police. In 1970, he enrolled in college to study police science and psychology. He was absolutely obsessed with becoming a police officer. He applied to join the police several times and failed at doing that. This was a fixation for him throughout his life. I think failing was one of the factors in the background of who he became. He wants that legitimate control. He wants that legitimate power. And if he can't get it legitimately, he's going to get it by some other means. After failing to get his dream job as a police officer, Bianchi found work as a security guard. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, his cousin Bono was a career car thief. By this point in 1970, the 36-year-old had been married and divorced twice and fathered eight children by three different women. A lot of women said that he had a very sexual, strong feeling about him, but it was a scary, frightening kind of thing. It was kind of a predator kind of a thing. And he had been through a whole lot of women. He was very sexually active, and he was proud of that reputation. Buono's attitude to women and to the women he married was abusive. There can be no doubt about that. And each of them described his abusiveness, his drama, threatened with a gun, persistently kicked, brutalised. They were very aggressive sexually, even with young, young girls. There was something in Buono which saw women as objects, a man who saw women as something of his right. Before long, the two maternal cousins, who barely knew each other, would discover they shared the same intense loathing of women. Bono and Bianchi would move in together and become partners in crime. Soon, this dangerous team would be heading on a path towards murder. By 1975, 41-year-old Angelo Bono had served three short prison terms for stealing cars. He also had a long, dark history of domestic abuse, raping and beating former wives and girlfriends. But now, it seemed, Bono wanted to settle on the straight and narrow. Although he wasn't particularly well-educated, he was quite smart. He was capable of running a business. Indeed, he started his own business, Auto Upholstery. It was very successful. 
Matter of fact, the rumor is he did one of Frank Sinatra's cars. He also considered himself a mafia kind of guy. At home and at work, Bono was meticulous to the extreme. Bono was obsessed with cleanliness. He would bleach his house several times a week. He was able to change the brakes on a car without getting dirty. Um, when you see people who are obsessed with cleanliness, it's about feeling that everything is within your control. Meanwhile, over 2,500 miles away in Rochester, New York, Bono's cousin, Ken Bianchi, had been fired from his job as a security guard for stealing jewellery at the department store where he was working. In January 1976, Bianchi's family came up with a plan to temper the wayward 24-year-old. Their mothers are sisters and they think it's a good idea for these two to live together. And I think it is part of those this kind of Italian Mediterranean family values, you know, that, that if you're part of a family, then you're always welcome. You should always look out for one another. Bono was doing the family a favor, taking him in. This is something he didn't really want to do. This is a guy who lives alone. And to take in a boarder was something that, uh, you know, he wasn't happy with. Bianchi apparently looked up to Angelo Bono, his older cousin, kind of admired the, the tough guy image that he projected. Once again, Bianchi tried for a career in the police, this time with the LAPD. But once again, he failed his exams. In the end, Bianchi resorted to lies to get a respectable job. He had phony certificates made up showing that he was a graduate of Columbia University and had a degree in psychiatry, and he was actually a psychologist. A psychologist in Los Angeles actually hired this guy, and he was seeing his patients. He had a gift of really selling himself, and he did. He was a sociopath, and he was a pathological liar. In June 1976, Bianchi finally made it into the LAPD reserves as an unpaid volunteer. He also found himself a desk job to pay the bills. And at work, he met a new girlfriend whom he moved in with. By now, the cousins had a real rapport. Bianchi looked up to the older Bono and was only too quick to get involved when he suggested they establish themselves as pimps. He and Buono set up what only could be described as an agency for prostitutes. They target two young women whom they set up to work for them, to make them money as sex workers. It was a marriage made in hell. I mean, here you've got a sexual predator and a sociopath. Bianchi wants to be like his cousin Angelo. Say, he looks up to him, he's older. He was excited that it's a recipe for madness. But pimping prostitutes wasn't enough for them. To satisfy their own sexual cravings, they prowled the streets using a tactic inspired by an infamous criminal from the 1940s. When Bueno was an adolescent, he very much looked up to career criminals, and one particular criminal, a serial rapist called Chessman, who he became very interested in, had actually used a police ruse in order to target his victim. I think Bueno saw something there that lodged in his mind, and that would later come out in his offending. Angelo Bono had a security badge that belonged to his stepfather. And they used that to portray themselves as undercover police officers. They started using the badge to get free sex from prostitutes. They liked the fact that they could get girls back to their house and have them have sex with them, then play a badge on them and tell them that, hey, don't tell anybody we did this or you'll be in trouble. But the excitement of duping women for free, casual sex soon wore off. Bono and Bianchi wanted to up the stakes, to indulge a depraved desire. They both agreed, why don't we try choking somebody to death while we're having an orgasm? That would be something I'd like to do. That was Bono's thing. And of course, whatever Bono said, Bianchi went along with. It's what the psychologists call folie a deux. One adds 
depth to the other. One eggs the other one on. One's the sorcerer and the other one's the apprentice. And then suddenly they become partners in crime. At 11 p.m. on the 17th of October 1977, Bono and Bianchi were cruising down one of Hollywood's most famous streets, Sunset Boulevard. They had their fake police badges at the ready. Bianchi had a four-door sedan that could resemble a police car at night. I had no siren or lights, but it had the same color, dark blue and a white top. They used that car in all the stops and pullovers that they made. Here they spotted 19-year-old Yolanda Washington. She was a mum, she was struggling to make ends meet. She became involved in sex work and they picked her up, claiming to be police officers. Got her in a car under the pretense of who they were and Bianchi strangled her in the backseat. And that's where it started. They dumped Yolanda's body on Forest Lawn Drive, not far from Glendale. She was discovered early the next morning. She had a three-year-old child, and she's treated as a piece of garbage. From there, it just kind of accelerated. They started discussing what they were going to do. Let's take them back to the house. If we take them back to the house, then we can play games with them. And that's exactly what they did. Barely two weeks later, on the night of the 30th of October, Bono and police reservist Bianchi were roaming the streets once again. As they stalked Sunset Boulevard, a young girl caught their eye. Judy Miller was picked up on Sunset Boulevard near a hot dog stand. Judy was 15 years old, so a few years younger than Yolanda Washington, and she's been described as a runaway, but she's a child, she's incredibly vulnerable, and I think they recognise that, and they prey upon that vulnerability again. The killers lured Judy into their car under the pretense of hiring her for sex. Once inside, they pulled out their fake badges. She was trapped, and this time Bono and Bianchi had even more sinister plans. They took her to Bono's auto upholstery shop, where she was systematically raped. This change in offending is really significant for me, because when you're taking your victims to somewhere that's private, an environment over which you have control, this suggests that you want to escalate your offending, you want to spend more time with your victims, you want to harm them more. Using a ligature placed around her neck, they strangled 15-year-old Judy. Then the killer cousins dumped her naked body in bushes off a quiet residential street in the neighborhood of La Crescenta. When she was found the next day, detectives noted the lack of drag marks on her body. That gave us a kind of an indication that there might have been two guys, because if you have a dead body and you're lugging it around, you want to put it in place here and place there, it's very difficult. And if you do that, you usually will have leave marks on the body if you're dragging the heels. But she was placed in an area, and that's where her body was found. There was a fiber on her eyelid that was visible, uh, and obviously she was blindfolded, which left the fiber. But despite the police's hunch that there might be two killers working together, there was little else left at the crime scene in the way of clues to help them identify the murderers. Bono and Bianchi felt unstoppable, and on the 5th of November, they decided to target a different type of victim. Now you have a complete change of pace. It wasn't only directed at sex workers. Lisa Kasnin was a perfectly ordinary, upright girl, 21. She was a dancer, quite a good career, with an extraordinary group called the LA Knockers. Lisa Kasten was walking to her apartment and police ruse was used with her. She was brought back to Bono's shop you know, raped and murdered, and her body was found in the bushes off a street in Glendale. Now Bono and Bianchi had killed three young women. They were reveling in their success and growing in confidence. They were getting into their stride. They would discuss it. 
According to Kenneth Bianchi, they would sit down, well, what do you want to do tonight? Let's try Hollywood again. Let's pick up another whore in Hollywood. They took him to Bono's upholstery shop and sexually assaulted him, strangled him, took their nude body and threw him in the hillside around the city of Los Angeles. It was a game. The rampage continued. Just four days later, on the 9th of November, 28-year-old actress and model Jane King was stopped at a Hollywood bus bench. She was taken to Bono's workshop, where she was raped, strangled, then dumped next to the freeway in Glendale. The killer cousins had claimed four victims in nearly as many weeks. It was the most extraordinary spree. And I think one of the things that made them, in the end, terrify Los Angeles, there was no pattern. They literally, like lightning strikes, they had an appetite. And that appetite knew no bounds. But Bono and Bianchi's killing spree had barely just begun, and soon they'd become the talk of Tinseltown. On Sunday, the 13th of November, they set their sights on two children. Sonia Johnson and Dolores Cepeda were spotted getting on a bus after a Sunday afternoon shopping. They get off the bus, almost certainly. They're impressionable, they're 12 and 14. Two men stop them, they say they're police officers. They get them into the car, they take them back to Bono's. I mean, it is unimaginable. This time, the victims were imprisoned and held captive in Bono's home. The two schoolgirls were gagged and bound, then repeatedly raped over five days. What they must have subjected them to and what those girls must have felt is literally horrifying. Depravity is too good a word for it. It is utter depravity. At the end of their torture, the two children were strangled. The killers dumped their bodies four miles from Bono's home on a hillside near the famous L.A. Dodgers stadium. It's a street that Bono referred to and uh, since he had grown up in the area as the cow patch. And apparently their bodies were just thrown down the hill. It is behavior of the most disgraceful because it's inhuman. It is animalistic. Despite raping and killing six women and girls in barely a month, Bianchi and Bono were left wanting for more. They're varying their offending at this point in time, and offenders will do this because they will get bored. They will want to mix things up. They will want to make things interesting. Their victims were no longer just randomly picked off the streets. On the 20th of November, two days after their last killing, Bianchi called at the home of 20-year-old art student Christina Weckler. Christina Weckler had met Kenny Bianchi. They lived near each other. He succeeded in getting her out of her apartment on a roost that he was now a L.A. police officer, and her car was involved in an accident. Why the poor girl went, I don't know, but that was it. They abducted her, took her back to Bono's house. Once at Bono's home, the killers had devised a new, sickening act of torture for their seventh victim. They use a more elaborate method of killing her. Not simple manual strangulation, but they put a plastic bag over her head and put a gas pipe into it and effectively suffocate her. The killers also injected Christina's arms and neck with air and cleaning solutions to try and induce a fatal embolism. There was a mark on her neck where they put cleaning fluid in her neck with the syringe. This is incredibly sadistic. It's incredibly drawn out. It's an escalation in their offending. They're enjoying the process of watching their victims die, of having that ultimate power and control over their life and death. And this is something that's only going to get worse. Then they dumped Christina's body on another remote hillside in Highland Park, several miles from Bono's Glendale home. It was a Sunday. I was notified at home. They said, we got a dead girl out here, and then it's definitely a murder victim. So I went out, 
did my usual crime scene investigation, and I noted the ligature marks on the hands and on the ankles. Detectives also noticed that the bodies continued to be placed and not dragged to each location. They were still convinced that they had more than one killer on the loose. We had put a lot of uniformed policemen in the area of northeast Los Angeles looking for two suspects or one suspect as a serial murderer. So we were focusing in the area where the girls were originally abducted. I think that information got out somehow through the media. So what did Bianchi and Bono do? They drove all the way out to the valley to look for their next victim, 25 miles away. On the 28th of November, eight days after their last killing, Bianchi and Bono were cruising the streets of the San Fernando Valley. They spotted 18-year-old business student Lauren Wagner driving home. They uh, followed her and she parked right across the street from where she lived. They stopped her, pretended they were police officers, and said they would have to take her in a car, and she resisted. She kind of vocally resisted. And they got her in a car and took her to Bono's house. Lauren was bound to a chair and gagged in Bono's home. This time, the cousins thought they'd experiment with a different type of torture. They took wires, plugged them into the wall, kind of pulled the wires apart, and taped the wire to the girl's hand and then plugged it in to electrocute her. There were burn marks in her hands from the wires. Lauren's body was dumped once again on one of the city's hillsides. Her parents had noticed their daughter's absence and were concerned when they found her abandoned car with the keys left in the ignition. And this was something that was out of the ordinary. She wouldn't normally do that. So immediately, they knew that something was wrong. They knew something was amiss. So they contacted the local police department. She was discovered the next day on the 29th of November. Her body was found once again on the side of a hill on a little street in the Glendale, LA area. And she was lying there naked as the others with ants crawling all over her body. Upon seeing her, we knew right away that she and Christina Weckl were killed by the same people. Both had very similar ligature marks on the body, around the neck and one on each wrist and one on each ankle. We began referring to that as five-point ligatures. Forensic investigators also found a small fibre stuck to the adhesive left by the tape that had been used to attach the electrical wires to Lauren's hand. Detective Bob Grogan went to her parents' home to break the devastating news about their daughter. But word of an eighth strangling victim had got out, which meant the LA press were already one step ahead. On the street where the Wagners live was all the media in Los Angeles trying to interview Mr. and Mrs. Wagner. I hadn't even notified them. And they were running around with their microphones looking for an interview. And I ordered uh, the uniformed police to move them off the street and get them out of there. If they turned this into a circus, and this was far from a circus. The press now had a name for the serial murderer, the Hillside Strangler. But a neighbor had some important information for police, which confirmed their earlier suspicions. She came out and saw two guys putting a girl in a car. That was the first time we actually had visible proof that there were two suspects. Couldn't identify them, but two were seen. With the killings making daily news in L.A., the police were now under pressure to step up their investigation. After the murder of Lauren Wagner, the detectives, we got together and said, we got a serial murder, we got a big problem, big problem. The chief wanted a task force. The media wanted a task force. So we got a task force. We got 100 policemen. But Bono and Bianchi were already planning their next killing and another change of tactic. They enjoyed the feelings of power and control that killing gave them, um, but they didn't want to have to go to the effort of going out. They wanted to make it easier for themselves. 
And going out, actually, it was quite a risky thing at this time, because this was a ruse that they'd used several times. So it was a combination of awareness of risk and laziness on their part. Yankee has found a flat, another apartment in the block he lives in, which is vacant. On December the 13th, Bianchi called an escort service posing as a client. 17-year-old Kimberly Martin was sent to the empty apartment. As soon as the door was open, she knew she had made a mistake. Bono and Bianchi were there and a struggle broke out. She had quite a severe head injury, almost as if she'd been bashed against a wall. So what I see in this case is an individual who knew that they were in danger and actually fought tooth and nail for their life. And I think that's testament to the strength of character of this individual. Bono and Bianchi took Kimberly back to Bono's workshop. After raping and strangling her, the killers planned a final act to taunt the city. Her body was deposited on the side of a hill, kind of overlooking the city of Los Angeles. And her body was kind of displayed like this. And she actually came to symbolize the hillside strangler, where she was thrown was kind of a way for these guys to thumb their nose at the world. And the media jumped on that, oh, the hillside strangler strikes again. So it was a panic situation in the city of L.A., no question about it. The Hillside Stranglers had now claimed nine innocent lives. Bono and Bianchi sat back and relished how their murders had become one of the biggest news stories ever in L.A. The Los Angeles Police Department were now under pressure to catch the killers before they struck again. By December 1977, the Hillside Stranglers had claimed nine innocent lives. Bono and Bianchi sat back and relished how their murders had become one of the biggest news stories ever in L.A. The Los Angeles Police Department were now under pressure to catch the killers before they struck again. It created an utter panic. If you were young and a young woman in Los Angeles at that time, I think you would have been frightened. Anybody would have been. Bianchi was reveling with the headlines his murders were generating. Still a member of the LAPD reserves, he went on ride-alongs with the police and was on patrol with a local sergeant just two days after Kimberly Martin's killing. He was asking questions about this murder and he was wanting to see the, the dump site. So he was trying to find out what the police knew, essentially. He was trying to get some information. And the sergeant said, hey, I work uniform. I don't, I don't know anything about that. So he was brazen enough to come out and make that kind of a statement. He told many people, I could be the hillside strangler. It didn't bother him, but you got to remember, you're dealing with a pathological liar, so he could say anything at any given moment. The two murderers decided to lay low for the next two months. But on the 16th of February, 1978, they couldn't resist 20-year-old Cindy Lee Hudspeth. She walked into Bono's shop to get a postery worker in her car. Big mistake. The predator of predators she's talking to and doesn't know this. Next thing you know, she's victim 10. They put her body in the trunk of her Datsun, her orange Datsun car, and they drive it to a higher area, Los Angeles, car with her body and it was pushed off of Los Angeles Crest Highway where she was found. But soon cracks began to show between the deadly duo. The status that Bianchi was enjoying as a serial killer seemed to be going to the younger cousin's head. Kenny Bianchi has got to the point where he's kind of got bone worried because he's bragging about these murders now. Hey, I went a ride along with the police department. Bono couldn't believe that. So there was a falling out. Bono threw him out of the house. It's out, I don't want to see you ever again. The two killers finally went their separate ways. That same month, Bianchi settled down to become a father when his girlfriend gave birth to their son. Now you have one of those wonderful contradictions. You have a superficially doting father who has evil intent who presents 
to use the contemporary phrase, as an upright member of the community, and yet is anything but. In May 1978, Bianchi's girlfriend left him and moved to Bellingham in Washington State. Desperate to stay with his son, Bianchi followed and found a job as a security guard. We've had this epidemic of killing, and it stops. But the trouble is, Bianchi can't stop. It has become too addictive. On the 11th of January 1979, Bianchi offered to pay two university students, 22-year-old Karen Mandick and 27-year-old Diane Wilder, $100 to house-sit one of the properties that he was guarding. It's unclear exactly how Bianchi forced these two down the stairs into the basement, but there's no doubt that he did. He also put a noose around their necks and then strangled them. Kills the two girls. And he does it on his own. He does it poorly. He masturbated on one of the victims. And he couldn't get it on, he couldn't function. He's now acting alone. He doesn't have the street smart, con wise Angelo Bono as a partner. Next day, on the 12th of January, Karen's car was found nearby by the police with their bodies hidden in the trunk. Bianchi's employer revealed his whereabouts and he was arrested. He claims that the killing wasn't done by him, but done by his second personality, Steve Walker. So he's claiming that he has another individual in his head who's telling him to do particular things. When the police in Bellingham realized their suspect had a Californian driver's license, they contacted the LAPD. Detectives there noticed something interesting on Bianchi's driver's license. Whenever you moved in California, you had a right on the back of your driver's license, your new address. Bianchi diligently did that. He put his address when he moved, which was on the same street that Christina Weckler lived on. That's a pretty strong connection. You got a guy who just killed two girls in Bellingham who used to live next door to a girl in Los Angeles who got killed? That in itself is a strong connection. Doesn't prove anything, but it makes it worthwhile to go talk to that guy. Now, there's a lot of things happening at that time. Bianchi is claiming to be a dual personality, and he's decided that this is going to be my defense. So one of America's leading criminal psychiatrists was sent to test Bianchi's alter ego, Steve, who allegedly appeared when he was under hypnosis. Dr. Martin Orm examined Kenneth Bianchi and had some techniques and tricks that he used and came to us and said, this guy's a complete fraud. Now Bianchi's lies had been exposed, he turned on his partner in crime. He says there's another person with him on the murders, and it's his cousin, Angelo. And it's the first we heard of Angelo. This is incredibly revealing, because there's no sense of loyalty whatsoever here. He's got what he wanted out of Bueno, so he just casts him aside and places the blame squarely on him. In order to get him to give us enough information so we can go down and arrest Mr. Bono, we have to make a deal. The deal is that he won't get the death penalty in the state of Washington, and that he will testify truthfully in Los Angeles on a trial, if and when we have a trial. With Bono now in the frame, forensic teams searched his home and workshop. Astonishingly, they could not find a single fingerprint because of his obsessive cleanliness. However, they did find some evidence they discovered the white polyester fiber on Judy Miller's eyelid matched up holstery material in Bono's workshop. They also found forensic evidence which placed another victim at his home. In the chair in the living room where we've learned from Bianchi where the victims were originally placed, a fiber was found down inside the chair. And that fiber was connected to a fiber that was found in Lauren Wagner's fingers. That's pretty positive evidence that this girl was in Bono's house. And that fiber evidence was extremely important evidence in this case. 
as Bianchi had already pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder as part of his deal, he did not face trial. His cousin, Angelo Bono, appeared in court on November the 16th, 1981. At the time, it was the longest trial in US criminal history, with Michael Nash, the deputy attorney general, prosecuting. The jury selection alone took almost four months. And then on top of that, Kenneth Bianchi was on the witness stand for about six months. The problem was that he changed his mind about everything. He did everything possible to sabotage that case against Angelo Bono. But the ploy failed after a mammoth trial lasting more than two years. In November 1983, Angelo Bono was found guilty on nine counts of murder. He was acquitted on the 10th count, that of Yolanda Washington, as it was accepted that he had been driving the car whilst Bianchi strangled her in the back. Both cousins were later sentenced to life in prison. Someone said, so how come you're, you're not celebrating? And I said, you have all these dead girls. They had family and friends who are forever scarred by all this. This is tragedy. But the brutal killers could no longer haunt the streets of L.A. In September 2002, Bono dies at the age of 67 in jail. And Bianchi remained in jail in Washington state. They're not the first serial killers, and they're not the last. But they were two of the worst human beings who've ever walked the face of the earth. They are among the most horrifying killers you could encounter because the rape, torture, and in the end, killing of utterly innocent young women for nothing but their own pleasure and their own gratification is unimaginably evil. The two cousins reigned terror over the city of Los Angeles. They strangled and raped 10 females in just four months, including four girls. They electrocuted and gassed some of their victims and relished watching their slow, painful deaths. That makes Angelo Bono and Kenneth Bianchi two of the world's most evil killers. Twenty-ninth of July, nineteen seventy-six, New York, USA. Eighteen-year-old Donna Loria and her nineteen-year-old friend Jody Valenti had returned home after a night out. As they sat talking outside Donna's apartment, a man approached and fired five times into their car. They represented everything that he hated, everything he resented. They were people with their, their lives ahead of them. They were out having fun. Donna died instantly, and Jody was seriously wounded. The gunman was 23-year-old David Berkowitz, a delusional loner who christened himself the son of Sam. He took five more young lives in just a year. Some people called it the summer of Sam. It captivated everyone. It created fear. The frenzy of activity was like nothing I'd ever seen. People genuinely were afraid to go out. You cannot overestimate or exaggerate just how much that fear gripped the city. The killings prompted the largest police manhunt that the city had ever seen. What he did to those families, they have been devastated and never got over what happened to their children. Bad times, it was bad times. Berkowitz was a serial killer who had an obsession with the occult. He murdered and maimed 13 young people in just over a year, spreading panic across the city that never sleeps. That makes David Berkowitz one of the world's most evil killers. Seventeenth of April, 1977, New York. When courting couple Valentina Suriani 
and Alexander Esau were shot dead. A letter to the chief of police from their killer, son of Sam, was left at the crime scene. With five young people now murdered, detectives knew they had a serial killer on the loose. A wave of fear descended on the city, as former reporter Brian Cates remembers. These series of shootings really did grip the city. People avoided going out late. This was a time of sex, drugs, and disco, and many of these shootings were involved in lovers' lanes and around discos. So you began to sense this growing fear, particularly among young women. People could talk about nothing else. The fear of Son of Sam was fueled by a battling press, hungry for the latest scoop on one of the biggest ever stories to hit the city. I was in New York in the 1970s, and the crimes literally hypnotized the city. They were everyday tabloid headlines. Uh, Son of Sam terrorizes people afraid in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. It was as though the city was afraid to take a breath. It literally grabbed the imagination of New York. At the height of the killings, New York City Police Department had 75 detectives and 225 patrolmen working to hunt down the killer. A former detective on the case, Bill Gardella, remembers how the hysteria even led to women changing how they looked. Once it was determined that he was targeting young females and white Maybe by coincidence, they had long brown hair. W women were going to the beauty salons, buying wigs, blonde wigs, or dyeing their hair. No case can match the frenzy and the fear of the Son of Sam killings. At a time when New York was the murder capital of the US, even Berkowitz's killings left an indelible mark on the place known as Fear City. If you think at the time that this happened, women's liberation, rights for women, but all of that freedom, all of those liberties were suddenly curtailed because there was this monster on the loose. This killer story begins on the 1st of June, 1953, New York. David Berkowitz arrived into the world under the name of Richard David Falco. He was born out of an affair between his biological mother, Betty, and a married Long Island businessman called Joseph. She became pregnant. He essentially said that he would not adopt the child, he would have nothing to do with the child, and uh, David was given up for uh, adoption. He was adopted by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz. They renamed him David. They were a middle-aged couple, Jewish, working class, and they had no children. So I think this was a family which was, was set up for happiness, really. You have this childless couple, you have this baby that needs a home. At the age of seven, David learned the hidden truth through a slip of the tongue. He heard the word adopted from his adoptive father, and they had to explain to him what that term meant. I think that probably made David very, very uncomfortable. I don't think he could grasp it. Soon the happy-go-lucky child became disruptive and difficult. At one point, I understand, they enlisted the help of a therapist or a psychologist to deal with his disciplinary problems, both at home and in school. Berkowitz never really gets along with his peers. He doesn't form particularly healthy relationships with them. He's a kid who always flies off the handle. He has poor behavioral control, so he becomes increasingly isolated. But at the age of 14, Berkowitz's world fell apart. His adoptive mother dies from cancer, and he's facing a loss here. But I think the culture at that time was still very much, we don't talk about our feelings. So this would not have been a helpful thing for him. A few years later, his father remarried. David was not happy about that. It made him angry. And this is where we begin to see the, the growth and real rage in his personality. On the 23rd of June, 1971, at the age of 18, Berkowitz joined the army to escape the strains of home. Here, he learned to use weapons, including the M16 rifle, and trained as a sharpshooter. Whilst he was serving, he chillingly wrote in a letter home to a friend, all of these courses will come in handy one day. He cryptically ended his letter by writing, one day there will be a better world. 
Berkowitz wrote saying, I've learned things in the army and I'm going to use them. Well, it's a, maybe a bit of bluster, but maybe also a horrifying first note in what would become a desperately criminal career. After three years, Berkowitz decided the army wasn't for him. So in June 1974, at the age of 21, he returned home. But his father soon left New York when his hardware store was robbed, leaving his son alone in the city. Berkowitz had dreams of becoming a firefighter, but instead had to settle for low-paid security work. The night shifts provided endless hours for him to ruminate. Berkowitz already sees himself as an outsider. But he's not settled. He feels hurt. He knows he's a loner. He knows he can't relate very well to other people. So this is when he starts to become quite dangerous. Feeling increasingly isolated, Berkowitz decided to track down his biological mother, Betty. He found her and sent her a poem on May the 11th, 1975, Mother's Day. Betty was over the moon to hear from her long lost son and they arranged to meet. She's delighted to see him and they have this wonderful reunion apparently. And they continue to meet and they have this kind of loving relationship. But soon the love for his newfound mother would sour. He meets his half-sister. This was the child that his mother didn't give away. And he realizes that he was a throwaway child and there's this other child that's been loved all this time by his mother. And he becomes furious. It's believed this rejection by his mother as a child was the genesis of Berkowitz's hatred for women. Once again, isolated and alone with his paranoid thoughts, he wrote to his father. Dad, the world is getting dark now, he said. The people, they are developing a hatred for me. So what he's doing in this letter is presenting himself as the victim, saying, poor me, I have this horrible life now. And he's essentially saying to his adoptive father, it's your fault because you left me. I'm sure at that point he is building yet more fantasies that he's been rejected not just by the world, but by women. That November in 1975, Berkowitz spent a month in isolation in his apartment. He nailed blankets over the windows and scrawled dark ramblings on the walls. In this hole lives the wicked king, he wrote. Kill for my master was another. I think this was attention-seeking behaviour, and he gets very frustrated that nobody comes to check up on him. I think there's a kind of sense of entitlement there that other people should be looking after me. On December the 24th, Christmas Eve, a delusional David Berkowitz decided to make his scrawlings about killing a reality. He left his self-imposed exile armed with a hunting knife. He wanted to seek out revenge for the rejection by his birth mother. Now the ex-soldier was on a mission to kill. He was in the area of Yonkers and he had a knife with him. And he walked up to a young lady, started stabbing her, she screamed, left on a couple blocks away and started stabbing another lady. She screamed and he left. Only one of those two ladies reported it. I think the timing is really significant here because Christmas, it's a family time. And I think it's when Berkowitz is feeling the most resentful towards people who have things that he doesn't. I think the thing that he would have come away with is I enjoyed that, I liked harming them, but I didn't achieve the outcome that I wanted and that was to kill them. That evening, Berkowitz reflected on his failure. In the coming months, he would try a change of tack. David Berkowitz, to the people who knew him, was this kind of puzzle of many pieces. And many of the pieces didn't fit. So that there were some who saw this happy-go-lucky, slightly shy, helpful young man, and others who saw this angry edge. Berkowitz developed an angst-ridden obsession with one of his neighbors, retiree Sam Carr. His neighbor's dog, Harvey, barks during the night and he finds this really annoying. And he will ruminate about this, he, he dwells on it. On May the 13th, things came to a head. 
when Berkowitz threw a petrol bomb into Sam's backyard. Scared for his life, Sam reported it to the police, but they couldn't find the attacker. Meanwhile, Berkowitz continued his reign of terror, setting fires in nearby apartment buildings. When we look at young people who engage in this kind of behaviour, fire setting is a way of them maintaining control. It's an externalisation. They have these, these feelings, they want to do something with those feelings, and rather than turning it in on themselves, they turn it outward to start harming other people and other things. Soon the world would know of David Berkowitz. After his knife attacks failed, Berkowitz decided on a different weapon of attack. He illegally brought a gun that he could use with cold, calculating precision, a Bulldog 44 caliber revolver. On Thursday, July the 29th, Berkowitz was stalking the streets of the Bronx. David Berkowitz was driving in the street looking for his next victims. 18-year-old Donna Loria and her 19-year-old friend Jody had been out playing backgammon at a local bar. They'd returned home and were sitting in their car outside Donna's apartment. They were chatting to one another when all of a sudden, out of the blue, out of nowhere, the passenger side window explodes. And what's happened is that Berkowitz has gone into a firing position, extended the gun with both hands, and fired five times into the car. Donna was fatally wounded in the neck. Her friend Jody was shot in the thigh. Berkowitz fled as Donna's father, having heard gunfire, rushed down from his apartment to the scene. But nothing could be done to save his daughter. It turned out that the bullet recovered was a 44 bullet from a bulldog revolver which was a rare gun. David Berkowitz said that when he left that scene, he sang a song on the way home because the demons had told him to go out and kill, and he killed. I think he quite enjoyed that high, that kind of elevated sense of status of taking someone else's life. He's targeting young people who are happy, people who have their whole lives ahead of them. And he feels, actually, I'm entitled to take that away from them because they don't deserve it, and I do. The police were puzzled at the motive for the shooting and wrote it off as a botched mafia hit. Berkowitz was disappointed that his first killing didn't create headlines in the press as he later revealed to the police. After that first murder, in August of 1976, David Berkowitz was at the Westchester County Mall, and he said nobody recognizes him as if somebody should know who he is. And he says, I wish I had a machine gun. In an attempt to gain the recognition he so desperately craved, three months later on the 23rd of October 1976, David Berkowitz struck again. This time he targeted a couple on a date in the nearby borough of Queens in a so-called lover's lane. An individual by the name of Carl De Niro is parked with his girlfriend, sitting in a car at night, and he's sitting in the passenger side, and Carl De Niro has long hair. It's believed that Berkowitz thought De Niro was a girl. Berkowitz shot into their car, hitting 20-year-old Carl in the head. To Berkowitz's disappointment, Carl survived and his date, Rosemary, was unscathed. A month later, he stalked the streets of Queens looking for more victims. In the early hours of the 27th of November, he found 16-year-old Donna de Massey and 18-year-old Joanne Lomino sitting on a step. He then walks over says a few words and shoots and flees the scene. Mr. Massey survived. Miss Lamino is confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Devastating injury. Berkowitz had once more failed in his quest to kill again. But his time would come in the new year of 1977 on January the 30th. 26-year-old Christine Freund was on a date with her fiancé, 30-year-old John Deal, when Berkowitz spotted them. He parks not far from where that couple was, and he observes a Christine Freund sitting in a car with her fiancé, runs up to the car and shoots 
Christine Freud, killing her. Instantly. Christine was shot in the temple and in the neck. Her fiancé, John, ran to get help, but Christine was later pronounced dead in the hospital. The young lovers were about to tell their parents about their engagement before Berkowitz took Christine's life in his second fatal shooting. None of the Berkowitz shootings were seen as particularly unusual until uh, the murder of Christine Freund. And here, for the first time, police said that they saw some connection between this shooting and previous shootings. Now we begin to see that there might be something more than a series of isolated shootings. Three days after Christine's killing, a 16-man homicide task force was established by the New York City Police Department. A pattern was emerging of a killer who had a hatred for women. Just like his stabbing victims, Berkowitz was targeting females with long, dark hair. They were in lovers' lanes, around discos. Berkowitz clearly had problems with women. He said later that he saw his mother sitting in those cars when he shot the girls. A pattern was also emerging of the killer's fascination for a particular location, lovers' lanes. It is believed that Berkowitz was a virgin. There could be a voyeuristic element. I've never had sex myself, and I bet they're about to have sex, and I want to see what it's like. I do believe that there may have been an element of trying to destroy his mother. What is clear is he's completely off the wall. Berkowitz had now shot six people and killed two women. Barely a month later, on March the 8th, he was back out on the streets of Forest Hills, Queens. The brazen killer was now gaining in confidence. This time, he chose early evening and a lone victim. College student Virginia Vascarigian is walking down the street. The time of 7.30 is much earlier than the previous incidents. She's walking down the street, and the assailant is approaching her. She sees him pull out a gun, and she puts her books in front of her head, and he shoots through the books and kills her instantly. Once again, Berkowitz fled the scene, even saying hello to a passerby. So when we look at Virginia, his third murder victim, he's starting to increase in confidence now. He feels quite invincible. He feels kind of elated. He attacks her in the middle of the street because he feels untouchable. He feels like he can get away with it. What was it that made him change his modus operandi? I think he just felt like experimenting. He's been in this state of collapse, if you like, this fugue of horror, this terror reign for 15 months. A single bullet from Berkowitz's 44 Bulldog revolver had penetrated 20-year-old Virginia's skull. When pathologists removed it, it confirmed the police's suspicions that they had a serial killer on their hands. They did a forensic comparison and found that the same gun used on the Freud shooting was used in a Vascarician shooting. Two days after Virginia's murder, New York City Police Commissioner Michael Codd held a press conference. He told reporters that they were on the hunt for a serial shooter. He announced that the bullet was a 44 caliber bullet, that it was fired from a Charter Arms Bulldog revolver, and that it was linked to at least three killings. And for the first time now, we see officially that all these shootings are linked. For serial killer David Berkowitz, his murders now made the headlines that he so craved. For the first time, we had a name for the killer, the 44 caliber killer. It was a perfect tabloid headline, and any time there was a shooting, young people involved, reporters went scrambling to find the story. Now, the city is in Berkowitz's palm. He's got the city now where he wants it. He's accomplished what he wants to do, which is to have the city in total fear of him. Even though he'd taken three innocent lives, the killing wouldn't stop. Berkowitz enjoyed the drama that was unfolding. He watched the news and took clippings about his killings as trophies. New York's number one news story was now spreading fear in the city. People read the story, girls begin to 
worry parents wouldn't let their kids out for late night dates. People began to see a pattern in these shootings that the, the victims were pretty young women with long brown hair. Girls began cutting their hair, dying it blonde. There was a, an overall growing sense of fear. The NYPD's Omega Task Force, now investigating the shootings, was boosted from 16 to a 30-strong team. But Berkowitz wanted to make an even bigger splash across the newspapers. Barely a month after being christened the 44 caliber killer, he would strike again. But this time, his hunting ground was the Bronx. On April 17, 1977, Valentina Suriani and Alexander Esau at 3 a.m. in the morning were parked in a car. When the assailant came up to the car, put his hand on the hood, and fired through the front windows. 18-year-old aspiring actress Valentina died within a minute of the attack. Her 20-year-old boyfriend, Alexander, died two hours later in the hospital. Berkowitz had successfully fled once again, but this time he had a surprise in store. They found a letter that had been left by the killer for Detective Joseph Borelli, the uh, Omega Task Force leader. And the killer complained that he had been referred to as a woman hater, and he was angry about that. Despite this, Berkowitz stated in the letter, I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat, the women of Queens are prettiest of all. For the police's psychological profilers, they were convinced this message revealed his motive was a hatred of women. What was interesting about the note, the spelling was good, but he always spelled the word women incorrectly. He would spell it W-E-M-O-N. If you changed the W to a D, he would have demon now, whether in his mind women were demons or what have you. But the, he was threatening to commit more murders as a result of that note. He's wanting recognition. He's wanting attention now for the things that he's done. But he's also saying things like, I don't belong on, on this earth. In other words, I am better than everybody else. Chillingly, one of Berkowitz's last lines of his letter to Captain Borelli warned, I don't want to kill any more. No, sir, no more. But I must honor thy father. Most disturbing of all was the name he signed off as, Son of Sam. It was the first time we had any mention of this name, the Son of Sam. And immediately, his moniker changed from the 44 caliber killer to the Son of Sam. And no one at that time really had any clue of exactly what that meant. He wants that brand, that identity. You can see that this is someone who thinks very highly of himself, and he's, he's quite disappointed, I think, that he hasn't had that recognition that he feels he deserves. What the press and public didn't know is that the Sam Berkowitz was referring to was, in fact, his neighbour, Sam Carr. Berkowitz was also sending this same neighbour threatening anonymous letters about his Labrador, Harvey. He's disintegrating in front of his own eyes, let alone anybody else's. He's living alone. He's obsessed by the fact that his neighbor's dog is barking all night. Berkowitz's torment came to a head on the foggy morning of April the 27th, when the ex-soldier shot Harvey the dog from his apartment block with a 22 caliber rifle. This is a man falling apart, literally. He's convinced that he's hearing voices, that his neighbour, Sam, is influencing him, and that the dog is sending him messages that he must commit demonic acts. Luckily, Harvey was not seriously injured, and with no clear view of the shooter, the police had little to go on. A month later, at the end of May, Berkowitz crafted another taunting cryptic letter, this time to Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin. Jimmy Breslin was the top columnist in New York. So if Berkowitz wanted publicity and wanted to find someone who could take his story to the people and whose story would then be read, Jimmy Breslin was the man to do it. In the letter, Berkowitz told Jimmy, Sam's a thirsty lad and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. The city room was flooded with police officers. And then for the first time, 
The Daily News wasn't simply reporting the story, the Daily News was the story. Son of Sam's letter confessed to the murder of his first victim, 18-year-old Donna Loria, and he asked Jimmy Breslin to celebrate the anniversary of her killing. This prompted outrage among everyone. So we had in that story not only the infuriating letter that uh, Berkowitz had written saying that Donna Loria was a wonderful girl and she should be memorialized, but also her family's reaction to that, uh, their anger, their deep, deep sadness and grief all came out in a single column by Breslin. A lot of people have interpreted this as some kind of affection, some kind of love. But what it is, it's about ownership and possession and control. And for many serial killers, the first victim is a very significant one, the first time that they start to feel like they're in control. So that's why there's an importance attached to her. There was no feelings of affection whatsoever. As newspapers battle for the latest scoops on Son of Sam, Jimmy Breslin's letter was published in the weekend edition of The Daily News to achieve maximum impact. The letter wasn't published until Sunday when the larger circulation would be available. The public release of Berkowitz's letter to Jimmy Breslin did create a frenzy and a fear in the public and among journalists. The media spotlight on the case resulted in 250 calls a day to the police hotline, with people reporting suspicions about neighbors, boyfriends, even their husbands. With the pressure of having to catch a serial shooter on the loose before he struck again, the NYPD even planted decoy female mannequins in parked cars to try and entrap the killer. I think the biggest challenge was to get him as quickly as possible because you knew this wasn't going to be the last time he was going to kill. That was the pressure that was put upon, I think, all the investigators at the time and, and the fact that you knew that it wasn't going to end. Sure enough, on June the 26th, Berkowitz struck again, shooting another man and woman in Queens. Luckily, they escaped with minor injuries. But his next attack, just over a month later in Brooklyn, would whip up a wave of hysteria that New York City had never seen. On the 31st of July, 20-year-old Stacy Moskowitz went out on a date with 20-year-old Robert Violante. That was their first date. And both Robert Violante's parents and Stacy Moskowitz's parents were concerned. And Stacy and Robert both said to their respective mothers, he doesn't go after blondes. He doesn't go after blondes. They felt that was going to be the case that night. After dinner and a movie, Stacy and Robert headed to a park in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Berkowitz was also cruising in the area, looking for his next victim. He pulled up close by. Berkowitz fired four times into the car and fled back into the park. Stacy remained in the car, seriously injured. Robert Violante blasted the horn, got out, staggered, and was leaning against the light pole. Robert was shot twice in the face. His left eye was shattered, and he was left permanently blind. Stacy was pronounced dead in the hospital 38 hours later. When he struck in Brooklyn, I mean, there was hysteria within the city. The New York Post had on the front page, no one is safe from the son of Sam. The number of calls that came in to the hotline was overwhelming. People now felt he could go any place, and he did. So the people who thought that they were safe before no longer had that assurance. Suddenly, he was all over the city, and his victims were changing. So clearly, that created a whole new element of fear that hadn't existed before. It is the most horrifying crime. People genuinely were afraid to go out. You cannot overestimate or exaggerate just how much that fear gripped the city. He'd taken six young lives within a year, and the serial killer was the talk of the town. Berkowitz was relishing in his rising notoriety. The New York Police Department now had 225 patrolmen and 75 detectives working full-time on the case. 
Former Detective Sergeant Bill Gardella was brought in to investigate the latest killing of 20-year-old Stacy Moskowitz next to a park in Bensonhurst. I was awakened in the middle of the night. They said, Sarge, it looks like we got a shooting in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Maybe the son of Sam. I jumped out of bed, got dressed, and drove over to the scene at Bay 17th Street and the park. We were then given other detective units in Brooklyn to assist in questioning as many people as we could. No one was safe. He could strike anywhere. Whilst Detective Gardella and his colleagues were hot on the trail for any leads, New York's rival newspapers were also on the hunt for a scoop on the latest killing. Former news reporter Brian Cates was sent to the home of son of Sam's sixth victim, Stacy, where he met her mother, Nesha. Nesha Moskowitz was stunned, really, by her daughter's death. We talk about what a beautiful girl her daughter had been. How could this have happened to us? And then she'd fall silent. She'd look down at the floor and then look at the pictures she had of Stacy and start to cry. Sitting through this experience of grief was very difficult as a reporter. You have this great sympathy for this family, for this horrible death. Meanwhile, Detective Bill Gardella and his team were on the hunt for witnesses who may have seen her killer. Three days after her murder, on the 3rd of August, they had a breakthrough. They found a 49-year-old woman who'd been out walking her dog just minutes before Stacy's shooting. She observed a male coming in, in her direction, and he was carrying something in his hand. I don't know what it is, but I was upset. I was, I was afraid. I pulled my dog, went back, made a U-turn, went back into my apartment, and a few minutes later, I heard shots. I heard shots. This new witness had seen a car being booked by a patrolling police officer for parking next to a fire hydrant. When detectives checked, there was no record of any tickets being issued. She insisted. I saw a summons being given out. We checked a second time, no summonses. We went back. She insisted so much, we'll give it one more try. Fellow NYPD detective James Justice was sent to meet the patrolling officer on duty that evening to see if he knew anything about this elusive parking ticket. When I was able to speak to the uniformed officer, he informed me what had happened, that he had left it in his locker and sure enough, there were four summonses given out, one of them to a David Berkowitz that lived in the Yonkers. That third attempt pick up that summons. If we didn't make three efforts, we would have not got Berkowitz then. Finally, David Berkowitz came onto the police radar. When Detective James Justice called Yonkers PD, another stroke of luck meant the dispatcher who picked up the phone was the daughter of Berkowitz's nemesis and neighbor, Sam Carr. Weed Carr happened to live with her dad in an apartment house right behind the apartment house that David Berkowitz lived in. And she related to me various stories about Berkowitz and their association with him and the, the problems that they had with him and the fact that Berkowitz shot their black lab. He was also told about another neighbor who'd been receiving strange letters and had recently found a fire burning outside his door. The neighbor suspected Berkowitz was to blame. The strangeness of what this guy was doing and the fact that he wasn't related to Sam Carr, but the name Sam was there, and I put this all in a report my inspector asked me how everything went, and I said to him, I got a gut feeling we have the guy. Two detectives from the Son of Sam investigation were sent to Berkowitz's apartment on Pine Street, Yonkers. They found his Ford Galaxy parked outside and cautiously peered in through the window to see if there was any incriminating evidence. They look into the car. And on the floor of the rear of the car, there is a army duffel bag. And protruding from the duffel bag, we thought was a submachine gun, was a semi-automatic rifle. The detectives found that Berkowitz's car was unlocked. They enter the vehicle, 
and they come up with a letter addressed to the Suffolk County police chief. The letter stated, you can't stop me, I'm coming out. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back to split the case wide open. This was the son of Sam. Detective Sergeant Bill Gardella was called with news of this exciting find. With five of his NYPD team, they rushed over to stake out Berkowitz's apartment block. Four hours later at 10 p.m., their patience finally paid off when the killer approached his car. I took my gun out, ran down the sidewalk as fast as I could to confront Berkowitz before he had an opportunity to go for his gun. And I screamed at him, police, don't you go for a gun. And he slowly turns his head like this and smiles. So while he said, you got me, what took you so long? I think he knew that this was coming. He knew he wouldn't be able to get away with it forever. But this is someone who is, is very used to being in control. And he remains in control. He smiles, which I think the police find quite unnerving. Once handcuffed and arrested on the journey in the police car from Yonkers back to New York City police headquarters, serial killer David Berkowitz was ready to indulge in his newfound fame. Berkowitz says, hey, guys, I guess the press is waiting for me at New York City Police Headquarters with their cameras. Can you do me a favor? Can you comb my hair? He's going to serve a life sentence in jail. He's concerned about his hair. And then when we pulled up to police headquarters, there were a few people on the street screaming. And I told the captain that was with me, Cap, I says, I want to go in the garage. He said, Bill, no, let's get our pictures taken. The mayor was at police headquarters. That was the end. That was it. New York Daily News reporter Brian Cates was on a night shift when he got the news that son of Sam had finally been arrested. Everybody was a buzz with this. There was jubilation in the city. Um, and in fact, there were parties at uh, bars and clubs celebrating the fact that he'd been captured. There was a collective sigh of relief that the police had got their man and that hopefully the killings were over. There's no question that Berkowitz would have gone on. He would have killed again and again and again until he was eventually stopped. The classic serial killer. They don't stop until they're caught. The police had captured Berkowitz just in the nick of time. Using the semi-automatic rifle found in his car that weekend, the son of Sam was planning a mass shooting. Detective Sergeant Bill Gardella was one of the first police officers to search his apartment. Any time I speak about his apartment, my body starts to chill because it's something that I had never seen before. He had photographs of all the girls he killed on the floor. He had cut them out of the newspapers and he had holes in the wall. Voices used to come out of those holes to tell him to go out and kill. And he used to try to stop the voices by, by hitting the wall. And then he would write a note next to each of the holes. One of the notes I pretty much committed to memory, it said, hi, my name is Mr. Williams. I live in this hole. I'm raising little children to be killers. Can't wait until they grow up. It just it was a sight I never forgot. And it's the only thing in my lifetime that if I talk about it, I get the chills. Strange satanic symbols were also scrawled across Berkowitz's walls. During the police interviews that followed, he confessed to carrying out the shootings and claimed that the devil was talking to him through neighbor Sam Carr's dog, instructing him to kill. When it came to his trial, psychiatrists were split on whether he was mentally fit to stand. These claims that he was hearing voices, that his neighbor's dog, Harvey, was essentially talking to him, and this was the voice of a demon. Um, I think this is nonsense, to be honest. I think this is just part of his performance of trying to appear to be insane, because he's been caught now, and he wants to secure the best possible outcome for himself. And that outcome will always be better if you claim you're not responsible for what you've done. In the end, Berkowitz was deemed fit to stand trial, as it was ruled, he understood the charges against him. But after consulting a priest, son of Sam had an unexpected surprise up his sleeve. His lawyers wanted him to mount an insanity defense and go to trial. Berkowitz determined that he would not do that, that he would plead guilty, which he did, meaning that there would be no trial. 
On the 12th of June 1978, 25-year-old David Berkowitz was finally sentenced to a total of 365 years in prison. This is someone who's never, ever going to be released from prison. And I think he would have gone on to kill more people had he not been arrested. This man is incredibly dangerous. But the name Son of Sam is indelibly marked on the city he terrorised. That fear was fueled, of course, by the media. At the time of his last murders, the entire world reported on the capture of David Berkowitz. That's how far his reach uh, extended. He didn't do it for money. He didn't do it for sex. He did it because he felt like it, because he wanted to. And that makes him a very evil man indeed. Berkowitz mercilessly gunned down and killed six young people who were merely out enjoying themselves. He brutally wounded seven others, leaving them with life-changing injuries. He terrorized a city that's still living with trauma of his crimes. That's what makes David Berkowitz one of the world's most evil killers. On January the 2nd, 1981, two policemen approached a parked car on Melbourne Avenue in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, to talk with a couple sitting in the front. The officers had no idea they were about to arrest a man who'd murdered 13 women and evaded the authorities for over five years. The relief that the man behind these horrible offences had finally been caught and was behind bars was immense. Peter Sutcliffe, the man the press were calling the Yorkshire Ripper, had a cold-blooded M.O. He was attacking helpless women with a hammer before stabbing them to death with a screwdriver. The streets became quieter and quieter because on the horizon was this, this monster called the Yorkshire Ripper. The whole of Britain was terrified by the elusive murderer who seemed to kill for his own enjoyment. Peter, in my opinion, was a ruthless, cold-hearted killer who actually enjoyed going out and killing. He got a thrill, he got a buzz. Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, had undoubtedly become one of the world's most evil killers. Peter Sutcliffe is one of the most infamous killers in British history. For five years, he evaded capture while brutally murdering 13 young women across the north of England. It was an investigation with twists and turns and a case that still haunts the British public to this day. For years, women and girls felt that simply leaving their homes at night meant taking their lives in their hands. When Sutcliffe was eventually apprehended on January the 2nd, 1981, it brought an end to a manhunt that had both terrified and captivated the nation. The press had dubbed him the Yorkshire Ripper. For women, it was a very frightening time, and they were stuck in this awful position of being told they shouldn't go out at night. It had an enormous social effect on the country. As well as his 13 victims, Sutcliffe had attacked at least seven more women. His arrest was a huge relief for the under-pressure detectives at West Yorkshire Police. They attacked at random. We couldn't anticipate his moves. The whole of the north of England was held in a, well, a grip of terror, really, by this man. There was a sort of, I can only describe it as a gothic-type cloud over the area. But the Yorkshire Ripper's story begins over 70 years ago. Peter Sutcliffe was born on the 2nd of June 1946 in the market town of Bingley on the outskirts of Bradford, West Yorkshire. He was the youngest of quite a large family. His brothers and sisters were all of uh, strong character. They were all working class, uh, could look after themselves. But Peter was, was a shy boy and uh, very much attached to his mother. His mother was somebody who was very much dominated and controlled by his father. So I think he had quite a lot of sympathy for his mum and he thought the world of her as a child. But Peter was somebody who was quite shy, quite awkward. He was quite skinny and, and scrawny. 
And I don't think he ever lived up to his father's expectations. And I think that planted that seed of shame in Peter Sutcliffe that would come to, to shape the rest of his life. Sutcliffe's awkward demeanour as a child manifested into a dysfunctional adulthood, demonstrated in his early career choices. Peter Sutcliffe had a variety of different jobs throughout his life. Um, he worked as a grave digger for, for quite a period of time. And it was reported that he stole things from the corpses that he was burying. Now, that suggests to me that he wasn't horrified or repulsed by dead bodies, and, and that's something that would be quite influential later on. On Valentine's Day 1967, 21-year-old Sutcliffe met Sonia Shermer. The pair began a long-term relationship, eventually getting married in August 1974. The relationship that he had with his wife, Sonia, appeared to have been a decent one. And I think he would have treated her fairly well because she served a purpose for him. Women like his mother and his wife, he saw as carers and nurturers, people who would look after him. Other women, I think he saw somewhat differently. I think Peter Sutcliffe's view of women is, is very black and white. They are either Madonnas or they are whores. So they're either these perfect domestic angels or they're these sinful creatures. These opposing views on women collided with one another when a family revelation dramatically altered 23-year-old Sutcliffe's world. His mother, whom he'd looked up to as a child, had been unfaithful. His mother had had an affair uh, with a policeman and his father had decided to confront his wife um, at a hotel where she was meeting this particular man, and took Peter uh, with him. Peter's father basically humiliated her and said, look, I know all about what's going on. And the children found out as well. So I think this kind of further cemented ideas as to what women were, what could be expected of them, um, always to be cautious and wary of them. I think there was every possibility that after seeing uh, his mother and, and seeing what happened, that that possibly preyed on his mind and affected his attitude towards women. Sutcliffe began to visit the red light districts of Yorkshire and find solace in prostitutes. But his feelings for these women would soon lead to violence and eventually murder. It's never been established precisely when Peter started his attacks. The first recorded one, or the first known one, it was sometime in 1969 when he was with a friend called Trevor Birdsall. And Peter told Trevor that he was looking for a particular prostitute who owed him money. Um, they cruised Leeds. And Peter told Trevor to suddenly stop the car. He jumped out of the car, suddenly disappeared, followed her down the street and, and whacked her on the back of the head and then ran sweating back to the car and away. The following day, the police came round and confronted Sutcliffe. He acknowledged that he'd struck the woman. He said he'd just given her a light blow with her hand. And because the woman was working as a prostitute, she didn't want any more problems with the police, and so she didn't go ahead with the complaint. Had he been arrested then, had he been listed as somebody attacking a woman uh, in, in this aggressive way, who knows whether or not it would have been much easier to find him. Whether there were other attacks between 1969 and 1975, nobody really knows. But his first real attack came in, in 1975. By October of that year, Sutcliffe was living with his wife Sonia in Bradford and working as a long-distance lorry driver. On the morning of October the 30th, 1975, just 12 miles away in the Chapeltown area of Leeds, the body of 28-year-old Wilma McCann was discovered in a local park. Wilma McCann was a Scottish woman who had come down to Yorkshire. She was working as a prostitute. She was very hard up and it was very difficult for her because she had uh, young children, young family to support. And I think that was the only way she felt she could get enough money. The attack on Wilma McCann set in motion what would become a clear pattern and regular method of ambush by the killer. His modus operandi was to use a ball pain hammer and was to strike them very hard and very fast on the back of the head so they fell unconscious. He used his hammer and hit her over the back of the head 
and then he stabbed her 15 times in the neck, chest, and, and abdomen. But the police were no closer to catching the killer, and three months later, on the 20th of January, 1976, another woman was murdered in Leeds. 42-year-old wife and mother, Emily Jackson, who'd vanished after a night out at her local pub. Emily's son, Neil, was 17 years old at the time. He remembers receiving the tragic news on that fateful morning. I've come downstairs. My dad's loading one of the vans up for work, and I'm getting my boats on ready for going to work and having a pot of tea. When they were knocking at the door and it opened the place, and that's when I first knew. And it first knew when, like I said, for Dad, when when the place knocked at the door. I can still remember it, plain as day. Again, a hammer had been used in the brutal attack. Emily had also been stabbed a total of 52 times with a screwdriver. Like Wilma McCann, Emily Jackson had been working as a prostitute to make ends meet. It was just to help the family in dire states, is what I've been told after, afterwards. When fam family were in hard times work, I should went elsewhere, but I didn't realise till well after. This time, police were able to recover from the scene a key piece of evidence. On Emily's right thigh was a very firm and visible footprint from a size 7 Wellington boot. For some inexplicable reason, he stamped on her thigh uh, with such force that it left an imprint of the sole of his boot on her thigh. Our police tried to trace that boot, or the manufacturers of the boot, which they did, and then try and find out people who had bought them, but it didn't come to anything. Once again, the trail went cold. It was over a year until a murder with a familiar MO took place in Leeds. On the morning of February the 5th, 1977, the body of 28-year-old Irene Richardson was discovered. She'd been savagely murdered, another prostitute killed with a hammer. West Yorkshire police were suddenly dealing with a serial killer. What they didn't realise is that this was just the beginning of what would become one of the most infamous series of murders in British history. Less than three months after the death of a third victim, Irene Richardson, the killer struck again. On the night of the 23rd of April 1977, 32-year-old prostitute Patricia Atkinson became victim number four. She was murdered in her own flat, this time not in Leeds, but in nearby Bradford. She believed that if she invited customers into her flat, she was safe because all the killings had taken place in isolated parks or back alleys. So she thought she was safe, but she wasn't. The killer hit Patricia four times around the head with a hammer and then mutilated her body with a knife. This time, detectives found a clue to link the murders of Patricia Atkinson and Emily Jackson. The police found the same boot mark on the bedclothes at Patricia's house, uh, Patricia's flat, as they found on Emily Jackson's thigh. This crucial link confirmed the authorities' worst fears. The killer was expanding his hunting ground and he seemed to have a favored target. All four murder victims had been working as prostitutes. They were very vulnerable women. It was very easy to persuade them to get into a car. It was very easy to find them. And they were used to not being uh, protected in, in any way. And so he would be able to drive along, ask them if they were up for business, and they would get into the car. And he realized then that as long as there was nobody watching what was going on, he could do what he liked. But the next victim would buck the trend and shock the nation. On the morning of the 26th of June, 1977, just over two months after the murder of Patricia Atkinson, two children in an adventure playground made a gruesome discovery. The body of 16-year-old girl, Jane MacDonald. She wasn't a prostitute. She was uh, a young girl going home, minding her own business. But suddenly, a schoolgirl was attacked and that changed everybody's perception of the sort of man they were looking for. By this stage, if it was a woman who was vulnerable, he was happy to kill them. Any woman was vulnerable if they were found on the streets late at night. This latest kill caused a great public outcry. Now, courtesy of the tabloid press, the killer had a nickname, 
the Yorkshire Ripper. After Jane MacDonald's murder, the press then and television actually became more interested in what was happening. You have to remember that nothing had happened like this since the um, Jack the Ripper in London in the century before. What did become clear was the attitude of that time because she was described in some newspapers as his first innocent victim, as though in some ways the prostitutes had been guilty of making themselves vulnerable to him. It caused a lot of anger amongst women, amongst feminists, and amongst any commentator with a heart. She was a victim who prompted the police to work much harder than I think they had been working at the time. What this did in the public mind was actually create mass fear. There was a great deal of fear. And as the killings went on and the attacks went on, that fear increased on a monumental basis. Women were frightened of going out at night. Women questioned where their husbands were, boyfriends were, what they were doing when a particular attack had taken place and they perhaps weren't where they said they'd been. The increased media attention in the case intensified the ongoing suffering of the victim's loved ones. It was flashed everywhere, no matter where you went. Papers, TV, buses, blackguards, it was advertised everywhere. There was no way you could get away from it. It made it harder for me just seeing photo of mum have been not there to talk to. With a full-scale manhunt now taking place, West Yorkshire police were desperate to capture the Ripper before he struck again. But he was seemingly always one step ahead. His next murder would take place across the Pennines. On the morning of the 9th of October, 1977, the heavily mutilated body of 20-year-old prostitute Jean Jordan was discovered on an allotment in Manchester. She'd been dead for over a week. This time, detectives found an important clue, a newly minted five-pound note in Jean's handbag, which led them to a 31-year-old lorry driver from Bradford, Peter Sutcliffe. The police found the five-pound note. They traced it via the banks and found that it had gone through the hands of probably 300 people, one of them being Peter. Peter was interviewed, but on the night in question, he said he was at a party and his members of his family confirmed that he had been at the party. The police didn't know it, but they had found the murderer. It would not be the last time Peter Sutcliffe slipped through the fingers of the authorities. Between December 1977 and May 1978, he would kill three more women, all of them prostitutes, all of them bludgeoned to death with a hammer. I think that the longer that serial killers get away with it, the more bold and, and, and the more kind of dramatic their, their offending becomes and, and the more prolific they become because they, they've been flying under the radar for so long. They may have even been interviewed by the police and, and, and subsequently not charged with anything. They do get to the point where they feel completely untouchable. On December the 14th, 1977, one woman survived an attack by the Ripper, 25-year-old prostitute Marilyn Moore. She described her assailant in detail to the police and a photo fit picture was released. By May 1978, West Yorkshire police had interviewed Sutcliffe on seven different occasions, but continually ruled him out of the investigation. Lead detective George Oldfield's attention had been diverted elsewhere. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. You are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. What really derailed the investigation, or largely derailed the investigation, was a tape from a chap in the Northeast, from Wearside, who sent uh, George Ofield a tape, which became known as Wearside Jack's tape, in which he said, you haven't caught me, you've been looking for four years, and really taunting the police. He mocked George Oldfield and said, your men are not doing very well. I've done another one and you still haven't caught me. And he had a Geordie accent, a Wearside accent. And as a result of that, the police discounted people like Peter Sutcliffe. 
It had been almost a year since Sutcliffe had struck, but early on the morning of the 5th of April 1979, a woman discovered the mutilated and bloodied body of his 10th victim, 19-year-old building society worker Josephine Whittaker in Halifax. The Yorkshire Ripper's 322-day hiatus had come to a devastating end. In August 1979, West Yorkshire police would pay another visit to Sutcliffe's house in Garden Lane, Bradford. Officer Andrew Lapchew will never forget the day he stood face to face with the Yorkshire Ripper. The reason for going to see Sutcliffe was because his vehicle had been sighted in three red light areas, in Leeds, in Bradford and in Manchester. Talking to Sutcliffe was like pulling teeth. You'd say to him, what do you do for a living? I'm a driver. Where do you work? Oh, Clark's at Shipley. He wouldn't volunteer any information without it being asked from him. And one of uh, our ploys, tactic if you like, an icebreaker, was to say to the wife, now's your chance to get rid of your husband if you want. Now, said jokingly, but it was an icebreaker to put everybody at their ease. With the Sutcliffe's, there was no reaction whatsoever, which I found strange, because at least you'd get a smirk or a laugh. He was quite an attractive man, you know, well-groomed, but he had no personality, no charisma about him whatsoever, no aura, there was nothing there. Lapchu felt so uneasy about his encounter with Sutcliffe, he submitted a report to his senior officers suggesting Sutcliffe needed to be investigated further. Lapchu was within striking distance of the forces most wanted. I had the report typed up and I says, I've interviewed this fellow, I don't like him. I says, I've got really bad feeling about it. It's an itch that I can't scratch. Anything to do with the case was attached to the report and I went directly to Dick Holland in the incident room. He put in a report to uh, his senior officers that Peter was a person who should be of interest, someone who should be looked at closely. And one of the key things that Mr Lapchu noticed was that Peter had a gap in his two front teeth. And this, he felt, could mark up or marry up with bite marks found on two of the victims. He asked me if it was a Jordi. I says, no, it's from Bradford, it's from around these parts. I says, but it's a, a dead ringer for the Marilyn Moore photo for it. And it, then it hit the roof. If anybody mentions effing photo fits to me, they'll be doing traffic for the rest of the service. It wasn't so bad that I had the report rejected. It was the manner of the rejection in front of about 50 people. So I could have crawled under the crack in the door after that tirade. But you've got to remember, these fellows were like gods. That's how much in high esteem we held them. The senior detectives on the Ripper case were so convinced that the killer was the mysterious Wearside Jack that they dismissed any other suspects. It was a mistake that would soon lead to the deaths of three more women across West Yorkshire. Police threw all their eggs into one basket and discounted a lot of others and spent many, many man hours, days, weeks trying to track down Wearside Jack. And that threw the whole investigation into kilter. It really did derail it. He'd had many escapes, Peter Sutcliffe, during the investigation. He was interviewed a total of nine occasions. He lied his way out on every occasion, and he was a very good liar. He always had a, quite a clever excuse as to why he had been somewhere. He had the perfect alibi because he was a long distance lorry driver, so he had a perfect excuse to be in different places at top odd times of the day or night. I think Peter Sutcliffe was, was rather amused by what was going on in terms of the manhunt for him. He'd been questioned by the police several times. He was right under the nose on multiple occasions. And even Peter Sutcliffe himself has said, I got to the point where I thought I must be invisible. So he got to the stage where he felt untouchable. He felt so powerful, he thought that he was never going to get caught. As the police were trying to trace Wearside Jack, Peter then started killing again. And in September 1979, he attacked a young Bradford University student called Barbara Leach. 
20-year-old Barbara was found murdered on September the 2nd, 1979, in Backash Grove, Bradford, only 200 yards from where she said goodbye to her friends after a night out. The women of West Yorkshire and the surrounding area were living in fear. Prostitutes were particularly in danger. Eight of the 11 victims had been working on the streets. They were all very, very frightened. They needed to keep working. But there was always this fear that the next man, the next client, could be the Yorkshire Ripper. He created fear and terror on the streets of West Yorkshire and Lancashire. He was somebody who was striking at night. Nobody knew um, where he'd strike next. He was absolutely terrifying for people. The mood across the UK as a whole was stifled and tense, awaiting the next move from the man the public knew only as the Ripper. We'd never had anything like it. The media coverage was overwhelming about it. So wherever you were, there was always something about the case. They had a million pounds worth of publicity with the hoax's handwriting uh, on billboards. Rewards were offered. It was a massive, massively intensive uh, campaign, really, both from a police point of view and uh, a media point of view and it saturated your, your whole life. The problem for the police was the days of before computers, and police in those days would log uh, information on index cards. Because of the notoriety of the attacks and the publicity, the police were inundated with information. They had boxes and boxes and boxes full of index cards which filled a, a, an enormous room in West Yorkshire Police Headquarters. There's been undue criticism of the police who made every move with the best intention with the information that they had. You cannot sort of anticipate what a murderer is going to do at random. All the stops were pulled out because all the police wanted from the top to the bottom was for this man to be captured so we could get back to normal everyday policing. For almost a year, there were no more attacks until the body of 47-year-old civil servant Marguerite Walls was discovered in Leeds on the 20th of August, 1980. She'd been hit on the back of the head, and in a change to the usual method of the Ripper, she'd also been strangled. Ligature strangulation marks are often very characteristic. The ligature will compress the neck, it will often graze it just a little bit, and when the person dies, that area of the ligature mark will go quite yellow, quite hard, and it's usually very characteristic, something that will be identified very quickly. Now, why he changed his modus operandi, nobody seems to know. Marguerite Walls was Sutcliffe's 12th victim, but the police were still no nearer to catching him. A month later, in September 1980, 20-year-old student Mo Lee moved from Liverpool to Leeds to complete her degree. She immediately felt the change in atmosphere, having arrived in the Ripper's home county. So in 1980, I would just uh, completed a foundation degree in art and design from Liverpool. So I ended up going to Leeds uh, to do a fine art degree. But there was a strange atmosphere there. The streets became quieter and quieter because on the horizon was this, this monster called the Yorkshire Ripper. There'd be another murder and it'd be closer to home. And we began to realize that as women going out alone, we were pretty vulnerable. Despite the continued rise in fear across the county, Mo and her friends felt an increased sense of unity against the unknown assailant. There was a curfew almost on, on women going out alone. There was that solidarity amongst the women and female friends and, and the blokes as well, that they'd make sure that they would walk you home. Mo and her fellow students were an independent group who tried as hard as they could to be unaffected by the events around them. But this would all change on October the 25th, 1980. I planned to go into the town centre of Leeds to meet a group of friends from art school. And I left that pub, I think it was about quarter to ten, ten o'clock. My friends were saying, oh, we'll walk you into town and you are going to be all right. And I'm like, for goodness sake, you know, I'm absolutely fine. It's not far. I got to the outskirts of the campus and there's a church and you can either take the long way round 
or you can go uh, through a shortcut street. I made a decision that it would be much easier for me to go through that shortcut and get into town so I could get home safely. But Mo was not alone. It was fairly dark, and as I was halfway through, I heard this voice calling to me. So I stopped, and I turned round, and I walked towards this figure, and it was a young man. I thought, maybe I do know him. I wasn't. He was so friendly, so friendly. But Mo was wrong. He was not a friend or even a kindly stranger. So I realised I didn't know this chap. And then I realised I was in danger. I just sensed this. And as soon as I started to run really quickly, his footsteps were behind me, getting quicker and quicker and quicker. And the fear, my knees turned to jelly. And all I remember was getting this massive whack on the top of my head. And I saw the ground come up towards me. And that, that was all that I remember. But it was real fear, like nightmare, deep, deep fear. I've never been frightened before like that, ever, or since. Fortunately, Mo's attacker was disturbed when a group of students approached after hearing her screams. The next thing Mo knew, she was waking up in hospital. I was pretty lucky. I think my bones are pretty strong. So the blow to the top of the head has let, left quite a large dent and crack in my skull. I had two puncture wounds to the back of my top of my neck, just below my skull, and cuts and bruises on my knees and elbows where I'd fallen to the floor. The police could not be sure the attack on Mo Lee was carried out by the Ripper, but they wouldn't have to wait long before he claimed his 13th victim. On the 17th of November 1980 in Leeds, Jacqueline Hill, a 20-year-old student, was hit over the head, stabbed repeatedly and mutilated. An attack that bore all the hallmarks of the Ripper. But Jacqueline Hill would be Peter Sutcliffe's final victim. Within two months, a routine police stop would lead to one of the most sensational arrests of modern times. The capture of the Yorkshire Ripper. Just after New Year, on January 2nd, 1981, Peter went to Sheffield and picked up a prostitute. On the same evening, a policeman with a lot of years of service decided to show a young rookie round Sheffield. The two police officers spotted Sutcliffe's car near offices on Melbourne Avenue in Sheffield's red light district. They decided to approach and talk to the pair. The cops asked, what, what's your girlfriend's name? He said, I don't know, we've only just met. And the policeman said, you know, I haven't just fallen off a Christmas tree. Um, so he, he already realised there was something odd going on. Peter said that he needed to urinate and the officers let him go up to a wall by the side of the building. While he was away, the young police officer did a, a PNC check on the registration of the car and found that the plates were false. So Peter was arrested and taken to Dewsbury Police Station. Once down at the station, Sutcliffe was searched. He wasn't carrying any weapons, but this time detectives weren't going to let him slip from their grasp. So one of them thought, let's go back to that place where we spotted him and let's see if he did leave anything when he popped out of the car saying he was going to have a pee. The police returned to the scene of the original arrest. They found the hammer, the attended murder weapon, and they came back with them. And gradually after that, Peter Sutcliffe realised that the game was up and eventually he confessed. And his only condition was that he be allowed to tell his wife, Sonia, before it became known to the general public that he was indeed the Yorkshire Ripper. It had been over five years since the murder of Wilma McCann, but detectives finally had the Ripper in custody. All the years of terror for women in West Yorkshire, all the years of frustration for the police had come to an abrupt end. Andrew Lapchu had suspected Sutcliffe may be the Ripper for the previous two years. He vividly remembers the moment a fellow officer told him the incredible news. She came in and says, they've caught the Yorkshire Ripper. I says, what? Really? Who is it? It's just somebody called Peter Sutcliffe. Well, it was like somebody punching me in the chest from the inside. The bottom had fallen out of my world. 
Sutcliffe's arrest made headlines across the country. He is being questioned in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper murders. We are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage. When Peter was caught, the press was all over it. At the time, it was probably one of the biggest stories since the Moors murders. The capture of Peter was front page headlines and on top of the news for days, not only in Britain, but around the world. His arrest was greeted with enormous relief. For six years, this man had terrorized a large portion of the country. The relief that the man behind these horrible offenses had finally been caught and was behind bars was immense. And that shadow that he cast over the country for, for those number of years passed. I think when he was finally apprehended, he would have felt a sense of resignation that this was over, that he wouldn't be able to commit any more murders. But I think he probably would have been a bit shocked as well, because he'd been getting away with it for so long that, that I thought he'd, he'd just be able to talk his way out of it again. A wave of relief spread across the country, but the announcement came as a shock to the family members of those killed. I'd seen it on the telly when, uh, when he got caught, and at first I, I couldn't believe it. When I started listening to it properly and realising, then I, I got confirmation through the police. Bit of a relief to say he'd been caught. People felt a bit safer. Another viewer intently watching the story unfold was Mo Lee. I was at home in Liverpool and his face appeared on the TV news. It was when he was actually taken from a prison van into uh, a courts and there was a really a good camera shot and I recognised his face and his eyes. I actually fell to my knees. I was alone at home, six o'clock news. I thought, that's the man I chatted to. Then I was really horrified because it dawned on me that he had attacked me. So that was my first real understanding that for sure it was, it was Peter Suckley. On the 5th of January 1981 at Dewsbury Magistrates Court, Sutcliffe was remanded in custody for the murder of Jacqueline Hill. Later on the 20th of February, he was charged with all 13 murders and a further seven attempted murders. Once he'd been charged, I think Peter Sutcliffe felt that he had a chance of not going to prison, but of claiming to be mad and therefore going to a secure hospital where life would be much easier for him. And so he emphasised the fact that he believed God had instructed him to clear the streets and that it had been the devil, a devilish urge, had, had made him carry these things out. The preliminary hearing began on the 29th of April 1981 at the Old Bailey in London. Sutcliffe pleaded not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. The trial judge at that particular hearing heard evidence from four psychiatrists, two for the prosecution and two for the defence. The judge stepped in and said, we need to be careful here because whilst I don't disagree with these psychiatrists, they're only going on what Peter Sutcliffe has told them, so we need to, to be very careful about accepting the, the word of a multiple murderer. Mr Justice Borum decided at the end of it that Peter should stand trial in front of a jury on the charges of murder and attempted murder. And that's what happened. The trial began on May the 5th, 1981. And the crowds had waited for hours, some through the night, to watch Peter Sutcliffe arrive from Brixton in the green prison van. The 14-day trial was essentially a discussion about whether Peter Sutcliffe was, as Judge Mr Justice Borum put it, bad or mad. On May the 22nd, the jury had reached their decision. As each of the 13 women's names was read out, the answer was the same. By a majority of 10 to 2, guilty of murder on all charges. This sees the end of the largest murder inquiry in the history of the British police, and we brought it to a satisfactory conclusion. I think when you look at Peter Sutcliffe's offending behaviour, here's somebody who's very much in control of what he's doing. Yes, his crimes are quite bloody, quite gory. They're incredibly violent. But he escapes, he gets away with it. He picks up again where he left off. He goes prepared to the crime scene. 
So he's somebody who, who knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing is wrong, and yet he's still continuing to do it. On the 22nd of May, 1981, Mr Justice Boreham sentenced Peter Sutcliffe to 20 life sentences and a minimum of 30 years imprisonment before being considered for parole. He was immediately sent to Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight. Despite being declared sane at his trial, in 1984, Sutcliffe was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and transferred to Broadmoor Secure Hospital in Berkshire. There's a real difference between prison and secure hospitals. So prison is a place for prisoners, for offenders. Secure hospitals are a place for, for people who are ill, who need treatment. A lot of people speculate that his paranoid schizophrenia was something that actually developed in prison. He was somebody who was vulnerable to this anyway, but because of the stress of, of the, the circumstances of being in prison, it, it triggered the, the symptoms in him. In 2010, a High Court judge ruled that Sutcliffe's sentence should be increased to a whole life tariff, meaning he'll never be released from prison. And in 2016, Sutcliffe was moved out of Broadmoor and back into prison at Franklin in County Durham. He is, without doubt, one of the most infamous murderers in the UK. Britain is not a country which has a reputation for serial killers. I think that's why it grabbed the public's attention to the degree that it did. 30 years after Peter Sutcliffe's uh, killing spree, the world is very different, very, very different. You don't see people walking about in the way that they did 30, 40 years ago. Nowadays, everybody's very cautious. Everybody's worried. I think Peter Sutcliffe has become this kind of iconic figure, this kind of criminal celebrity, and I think we need to be a bit cautious about that. We're going to lose sight of the victims, the people whose lives were lost in his killing spree. It's become more about him than it has about them now. Sutcliffe's legacy casts a deathly shadow over the lives he took and the lives he left behind. Peter Sutcliffe is never far from the headlines. You know, barely a few months go past without some mention of him in a national newspaper, and he is a, a notorious figure. In the years since his conviction, Sutcliffe has admitted carrying out a collection of other attacks on women, including two back in 1975 before his first murder, Anna Rogulski and Olive Smelt. He's never admitted to the attack on Mo Lee. Would it make any difference if Peter Sutcliffe confessed that he had attacked me? It just seems so, so unlikely. I've had to learn to live with the fact that that will never happen. I just wish you were here. Because I, I, I had some good happy times with him, man. I just wish you were here. It breaks me out knowing my son my grandson does here. Yeah. Since his incarceration over 35 years ago, Sutcliffe has talked many times about his killing spree, regularly taking the opportunity to seize the limelight. But he's still yet to give a reason for the brutal attacks. Peter, in my opinion, was a ruthless, cold-hearted killer who actually enjoyed going out and killing. He got a thrill, he got a buzz. Why he did it? Only he knows. He's never actually given a proper explanation. He's never given a cogent uh, reason for killing in the manner that, that he did. We may never know how many people Sutcliffe attacked or why he did it, but we can be sure no woman who crossed his path was safe. His reign of terror shocked the world as he evaded capture for over five years. The cold-blooded and brutal manner in which he murdered 13 helpless women is why the name Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, continues to haunt the British public to this day. November 1974, Wichita, Kansas. The city was gripped by fear as a serial killer was attacking people in their own homes before binding, torturing, and ultimately killing them in pursuit of the thrill. 
The police found semen at the scene, so there was clearly a sexual element to this offending. And they also discovered that the faces of some of the victims were quite bloated, which suggests that the killer strangled them and then stopped strangling them and then strangled them again. The man behind these gruesome killings was living amongst his victims in the very town he was terrorizing. He is a man who, for all intents and purposes, was upright citizen, and yet, while he was that on the surface, underneath there is no question at all, he was a monster. His evil is a different evil, mainly because he thinks that he's entitled to it. His name was Dennis Rader, but he would go on to create a murderous alter ego for himself, a brand of his own. Raider would stalk his victims. He would attack them in their homes. He would torture them and kill them. Raider's preferred method of murder, to bind, torture, and then kill, became his name, BTK. It took over 30 years for authorities to bring him to justice. Wichita didn't have a boogeyman, they had BTK. His gruesome crimes make Dennis Raider one of the world's most evil killers. January 1974, Wichita, Kansas. One of the world's most notorious serial killers began a reign of terror that would last over three decades. I think the thing that makes Dennis Rader one of the world's most evil killers is the sheer conceit and arrogance that runs through every vein of his body. The Otero family had just moved into the area where Dennis Rader lived. They became his first victims. He killed two children and their parents, leaving their other children to discover his crimes. Dennis Rader's first murder, he's chosen to kill four people. That is quite a significant undertaking. And I think that really is testament to his arrogance and his hubris that he thought he could do this. A pillar of the community, involved in the church and a scout leader, Rader would go on to kill another six times, with his last murder taking place in 1991, when he attacked Dolores E. Davis in her home. He's on a Cub Scout camp, which he slips away from, clearly supposed to give him an alibi, once again binds her, tortures her, and eventually kills her, this time with her own pantyhose. And he dumps her body a long way away. But this killer's ego and new technology meant that he was finally in the sights of police and the FBI after he wrote to local newspapers and a TV station to brag about the murders he'd got away with. If he'd have just sat there and kept his mouth shut, I'm not sure we'd ever caught him. And so, um, you know, that, that kind of arrogance and complacency came back to bite him pretty hard. Raider liked to torture people, and that wasn't just his murder victims, it was the families of his murder victims. So when he has the opportunity to relive and to retell the stories of the horrendous acts that he's perpetrated, he really does seize on that. He enjoys revealing all of the explicit and the gory details. For the decades he remained uncaught, Wichita, the largest city in the Sunflower State of Kansas, lived in terror of the killer who'd named himself BTK, bind, torture, kill. With killers like Raider, there is always knock-on effects. And someone who is killing in such a way over a period of time is going to damage the community. There is going to be fear. There's going to be looking out of the curtains at the neighbors. It just breeds an appropriate paranoia amongst people. When's it going to happen next? Who's it going to be next? When he was finally arrested in 2005, his reign of terror came to an end. But even then, he reveled in the attention. Raider confessed he didn't deny having committed these murders. And actually, I think he quite enjoyed having that notoriety. Finally, people knew who BTK was. This killer's story begins in 1945. 
He was born in Pittsburgh, Kansas on March the 9th, the eldest of four boys born to William and Dorothea Rader. Rader was born in 1945, and he was one of several children within a, a very traditional nuclear family. His father was strict, but not particularly abusive, and many children grew up in households like this. He was upright, he was a scout, he was on all sorts of programs for good children. He had the ability to blend in. He wasn't bullied, for example, as a lot of killers are. To his friends and family, he was a model child, but in private, Raider began to show his true colors. Raider claims that when he was a youngster, he abused animals, so he hung a cat and he hung a dog. We do see, in quite a few cases of serial killers, animal harm in the background. As he went into puberty, he described himself as looking at girly mags, developing a fascination with underwear, and then, significantly, and indeed deeply significant in his later crimes, was a fascination with bondage and sadomasochism. Having graduated from a local high school in Wichita, in 1965, Rader enrolled in Kansas Wesleyan College in Salina, 90 miles from home. However, he dropped out. In 1966, when Rader was 21, he joined the United States Air Force and remained in it for four years. He worked on systems, he was that kind of man. Systems are very much his kind of thing. He served abroad, sometimes in Europe. As far as we know, not a particularly distinguished career, but not a bad one. He returns to Wichita, Kansas, and marries a girl he was at school with. Raider marries and has two children. And from the outside, they do very much look like the respectable cereal box family, just like any other regular American family. In 1974, Raider suddenly and inexplicably changed from the respected X-Forces gentleman to a brutal evil killer. There has to be something that set him off because that first explosion of violence was so shocking, so dramatic, so utterly horrifying that you couldn't possibly have imagined it was like going from naught to 60 in two seconds. A new family to the neighborhood became his first victims. The Otero family had recently moved to Wichita because they wanted a new start. This was the beginning of a, a new chapter in their lives. But unfortunately, this was to be very short lived because one day the teenage children arrive home to the most horrendous scene. On January the 15th, 1974, Wichita police were called to the scene. Detective Tim Ralph was one of the task force investigators on the BTK case in later years. At the Otero house, they were actually called by the children. The three older children had come home and uh, uh, they had found uh, their mother and father. They called and the first responders or the first people that arrived at that time, they, they went to the bedroom, they found the father and the mother. The scene they discovered was horrendous. Dennis Rader had broken into the family home and murdered everyone in the house in a way that would become his trademark. He binds, ties up husband and wife with a Venetian bind cord, suffocates them. The older children didn't want their younger siblings to come home and find this because they thought they were at school. And so the officers went to their elementary schools in the area and found that both of the younger siblings had not made it to school that day. When officers searched the house, it soon became clear that the parents weren't the only victims. Nine-year-old Joseph and his sister Josephine, 11, were both found murdered. Their 11-year-old daughter is found hanging in the basement whether he killed her by hanging her or strangled her and then strung up the body. We have a situation where he's created elaborate knot work and hung the body up. It's almost like some sort of macabre art display. 
Rada appeared to have fixated on the younger daughter, Josephine, because he seems to have spent the most time with her body. She was the prize and the others were just obstacles that he had to get out of the way. He kills the boy, ties him up, leaves on the floor of his bedroom, again suffocated. Rada had killed four members of the Otero family, 38-year-old Joseph, 33-year-old Julie, nine-year-old Joseph Jr. and 11-year-old Josephine. The Otero case provided an overall mindset of this person, that he certainly was into some kind of minding fantasy. The way Raider had killed the family showed the beginnings of what would become his modus operandi. The police found semen at the scene, so there was clearly a sexual element to this offending. And they also discovered that the faces of some of the victims were quite bloated, which suggests that the killer strangled them and then stopped strangling them and then strangled them again. So literally holding them on the edge of life and death, watching the life drain out of them and then giving it back. So having that power over somebody's survival or somebody's demise is something that this killer very much enjoyed. This was not, sadly, the act of a madman. It was the first of a series of killings in Wichita that would come to terrify the town. With few clues as to what had happened or why, the Wichita police were baffled. Just a few months later, in April 1974, Raider struck again. Raider starts escalating in the classic profile system. Catherine Bright, who's 21 years old, good looking, he forces his way into the house with a gun. Catherine and her brother, Kevin, return at lunchtime to their house. And he forces Kevin to tie Catherine to a chair and begins to struggle with Kevin. Kevin is fighting back and Raider really doesn't like this. So he shoots Kevin in the head. Now, miraculously, Kevin survives and he's able to flee and summon help, but unfortunately, it's too late for his sister, Catherine. I think he tried to bind her up, but it just wasn't working, and the whole thing just came unraveled, and, and he would take out a knife and he would, he would very viciously stab her several times. And uh, then he left thinking that he had killed her, and, and uh, I don't think he realized that Kevin had run, had run out and uh, Kevin got a hold of a neighbor who called the police. When the first officers got there, Catherine was still alive, but she was barely breathing, and uh, she couldn't identify her attacker, and uh, she was taken to the hospital, and she died in surgery just a couple of hours after that. She's bound, she's tortured, and she's eventually killed. Catherine's brother, Kevin, was the first person to give clues as to Raider's identity to police. He describes a, a white male, you know, 180 pounds. We were looking for a single person. Uh, you were looking for this white male in his late 20s. Could cover a, a description of a, quite a lot of men in Wichita, Kansas. But at least it's something. Raider once again slips behind the mask, returns to being a pillar of the community, the police are left struggling. With no substantial leads and a brutal killer still at large, it was only a matter of time before Dennis Rader struck again. In January, they have the Otero killings. In April, they have Catherine's killing and Kevin's attack. They have no idea what they have on their hands. I don't imagine they get an awful lot of these kinds of attacks in Wichita. By the end of the year, the police thought they'd had a breakthrough in their investigation of the killings. In October 1974, and the police arrest three men on the suspicion of the Otero killings. Rada is furious. This is an outrage. Those were my killings. Nobody else had known. I'm not, a, this is it's not, accept, absolutely not acceptable. You can almost hear him saying it to himself. This is not right. Incensed that his murders were being attributed to someone else, Raider wrote a letter to the local newspaper, the Wichita Eagle, and hid it inside a textbook at the Wichita Public Library. 
He then phoned the Otero murder hotline to describe where the letter could be found. In his letter, claiming credit for the Otero killings, it's not quite um, well written. It's uh, clumsy, misspelt, bad grammar, but the overall motive is absolutely clear. Raider attempted to justify the killings with the phrase, I can't stop it so the monster goes on and hurt me as well as society. Society can be thankful that there are ways for people like me to relieve myself at time by daydreams of some victims being torture and being mine. Understanding the fear he was causing, Raider went one step further and gave his murderous alter ego a name. He wanted a brand. He wanted an identity. He didn't just want to be a nameless killer. So he didn't want to get caught. And he also wanted recognition for his crime. So he had to come up with a moniker, bind, torture, kill. Dennis Raider was to be known as BTK. And as he communicated with the press, Raider made a chilling threat that he was to strike again. He'd gone to work for a security company installing home security kits. Well, you can imagine what the residents of Wichita were doing at this moment. Suddenly, there's a serial killer on the loose. What are they going to be doing? They bought elaborate security systems and burglar alarms, which actually turned out to be quite ironic because the killer who was targeting the victims had actually worked for a security company. So the very person who should have been invested in keeping people safe was the one who we had to watch out for. It would, however, be nearly three years before Raider killed again. In 1977, Raider murders Shirley Vayan. Now, she's a 26-year-old mother of three. Raider follows home Shirley's five-year-old son. Once again, he forces his way into her house. He locks the children in the bathroom and he proceeds to torture and kill Shirley. The children are screaming in the bathroom. The only thing you must be grateful for in imagining this horrifying scene is they couldn't actually see what was happening to their mother. Once again, Raider used strangulation to claim his victim. It was becoming increasingly clear that Raider had an obsession with tying ropes as part of his murderous action. This is so far outside normal experience. The body seems to be almost secondary to displaying his skill at tying knots. Yet again, Radar disappears the scene as if a ghost. There's no clear forensic evidence. It's a random killing. Later that year, on December the 8th, 1977, with the police still having no clue about his identity, Radar would strike again. After the murder of Shirley Vian, Raider kills Nancy Fox. She's a 25-year-old secretary, and he'd, he'd likely stalked her for some time. He's getting better at his offending at this point in time. He's looking at the house. He cuts the phone lines outside. He waits for her inside the house. He waits until she gets home. She is, if you like, the archetypal BTK victim. He broke into her house, completely invading her privacy. He tied her up, he strangled her with a belt, he masturbated at the scene. But that wasn't all. He actually called the police. So there is a tape of Dennis Raider's voice. So they have the voice of the offender. This is Raider celebrating once again his own power. Here he is, swaggering. There can be no other word for it. That he knows something that nobody else knows, and he's taken another life. Within four years, Raider had murdered seven people, and yet the police had nothing to go on bar odd clues and a crackly voice recording. He had continued to evade capture and baffle the police, but he wanted 
more. Raider sees all of the attention that serial killers like Ted Bundy are getting, and I think he wants a slice of that action. But he wants to be more than Ted Bundy, more than the other serial killers. And I think that's very much what drives his offending and the form that that takes. A month after Nancy's death, Raider sends a note to the local television station in which he uh, explains that he can close her eyes so that she can pass away. I mean, it's an act of the most extraordinary vanity. And again, refers in the note to the television station to, I'll be doing it again. Those seven murders back in 1978 became directly attributed to BTK. And uh, he had made several communications. He'd sent them through the local paper at the time. So those seven were always attributed to him. Local police detective Randy Stone noticed that Raider was enjoying the attention that he was getting. He liked watching himself um, on TV. So, you know, communicating with the news media was, was part of his way of achieving the notoriety and being publicized and everything. And he enjoyed watching himself on TV and he favored the news media that had the best signal reception on his television. I think one of the things that sustains Raider's appetite for publicity is that he knows full well that he's not just terrifying individual victims, he's terrifying the whole town. They are in absolute fear. The sales of his security systems are going up rapidly. It's quite clear that there is a serial killer at work. It's quite clear that all the victims are in Wichita, which is not a huge town. And it's quite clear the police have no suspects. The community were particularly terrified by these murders because the police had to tell the community that there was a serial killer on the loose. They had to do this in order for people to take steps to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. The quiet and the peacefulness of 1970s suburbia really has been completely shaken by these murders. After scores of officers investigating and thousands of man hours, the police realized they had nothing to stop this killer. But then BTK seemed to have stopped himself. Years went by without any further sign from him. The case went cold. Could Dennis Rader have got away with it? He disappears again. And indeed, pretty much disappears completely. Two years pass, three. Raider goes dormant for a period of time. Whether there are murders that aren't linked to him or not is a matter of speculation. As the years went by without another attack from BTK, Wichita police called in the FBI. The local police form a task force, which ironically they nicknamed Ghostbusters, to try and find whoever the killer is. They are singularly unsuccessful. They do not get anywhere near Raider. The Ghostbusters team would keep investigating BTK for the next three years. There was a theory that, that he was either in jail or dead or had left the area. That theory was the basis for Ghostbusters, uh, was the theory for the basis for searching for men that had left the area after 1979. Over 600 suspects were tracked by the task force, but none of them could be connected with the BTK murders. Questions and rumors began to swirl about BTK's fate, and with no more murders in the Wichita area, some considered the horror over. So it isn't until 1985 that he kills again. But this time, he moves his victimology. Instead of a young woman, it's an older woman, 53, called Marine. In fact, she lives very close to Raider. OK, he hasn't actually killed anybody for years. Can you imagine what must be building up inside that tortured mind? With Marine Hedge, Raider is changing his modus operandi. Not only does he murder her, he then takes the body of all places to a church where he poses her in degrading positions and takes photographs and ultimately 
dumps the body. This is the use of a human being as an object, as a play thing. BTK was back, still evading capture and growing in brazen confidence. Raider dumps Nancy's body about seven miles away in a ditch. Clearly takes some trophies, as is won't, and shows no regard for his victim whatever. That case was not initially connected to BTK, mainly because it was a completely different part of town. It was a few miles outside of Wichita and how it's, you know, almost bordering Wichita, but at that time in a little city called Park City. A year later, on the 16th of September, 1986, Raider murdered 28-year-old Vicki Wegerly while she was at home with her two-year-old son. Raider spots a attractive 28-year-old mother called Vicky walking towards her house. We're not exactly sure how Raider got access to her, but what we do know is he did exactly what he's done before. Her husband is driving home for lunch. Their two-year-old son is left in the house with the body of his dead mother. Her husband discovers the two-year-old sitting on the floor on his own and goes into another room to discover his wife's body. This time, BTK was not a suspect. Police initially believed this was a domestic homicide and Vicky's husband was questioned. Judge Kevin O'Connor, who was deputy district attorney at the time, recalls the case. Mr. Wagerly, her husband, was always considered to be a suspect. So at the time I became involved was when the DNA could be replicated. And so they had the ability to replicate the DNA so you would have enough to be able to test it without using up your full sample. By the late 80s, police were beginning to have new technology to work with, and homicide cases like this were the first places it was being used. We started to learn about things like DNA, and uh, there was so much more, even video and, and computers came along, and the ability to track people through all those different mediums became something that we had to kind of look back and see if we could use some of that new technology for some of the old evidence. The DNA from the scene soon proved the husband was innocent and the Wegerly murder went unsolved. BTK had got away with murder again. Raider disappears. No contact with the police. No contact with the local television station or the local newspapers. He sinks back into the facade that he's been presenting for so very long of being an upright citizen, married father of two. Indeed, he doesn't kill again for five years. Raider's final known murder occurred on the 19th of January, 1991. The victim, 62-year-old Dolores E. Davis. Dolores doesn't entirely fit the picture with what he's been doing before. She's older, quite a lot older. He's on a Cub Scout camp which he slips away from, clearly supposed to give him an alibi, once again binds her, tortures her, and eventually kills her, this time with her own pantyhose. And he dumps her body a long way away. So the police find it difficult to fit a pattern here. This, this lady, Dolores, is again naked, dumped, but it's not anywhere near the house. The scenes were different. He removed them from the house. He had to kind of move his victim. His ideal victim had to move to where he could control them more, and that meant a little bit more mature victim. Police still had nothing that could help them identify the killer. This time, Raider returns to the body and takes Polaroid pictures of the victim, all the while wearing a feminine mask. Yet again, the police are confused. Raider disappears again off the radar. BTK had now murdered 10 people. He continued to roam the streets of Wichita, a free man for over a decade. But then in 2004, the 30th anniversary of his first murders ignites his ego once again. A local is going to write a book called Nightmare in Wichita. If ever there was anything that was going to provoke Raider's vanity, it was going to be that somebody else was going to tell his story. No, 
If anyone's going to tell my story, it's going to be me. Wichita, Kansas, 2004. The residents of this Heartland US town knew Dennis Rader as a church-going family man. But for decades, he was getting away with murder, binding, torturing, and killing his victims to build his own sick alter ego, BTK. It had been 30 years since his first murders. At the anniversary of the killing of the Otero family, one of the newspaper reporters did a story to say, you know, here's the anniversary story. It's, it's another year and, and it hadn't been solved. And evidently, BTK read that story and read in the story that there was a book being written about it, kind of had the opinion that who's more qualified to write the book than, than him. At this point, Raider resumes writing to the media. He wants to be back in the spotlight. He wants to be in control of the story. It's very, very important to him that he has credit for these crimes that he committed. He doesn't want anybody else taking away from that. Raider wrote to the paper under his usual pseudonym, Bill Thomas Kilman, initials BTK, and included a copy of Vicky Wegerly's driving license and photos from the murder scene. This was the start of a trail of clues connecting Raider to all of his victims. First of all, he leaves little items that he's taken from the scenes in unlikely places. He starts taunting the police, literally, saying, well, of course, you think you may know, but actually I know, and what's more, I can prove it. Here's some examples. BTK had returned to tease the police, and they knew that this time they had to catch him. One of his communications allowed investigators to make a breakthrough. He had left a cereal box at Home Depot uh, here in Wichita. He thought it was funny that to use cereal boxes because he's a serial killer. Law enforcement went out to Home Depot and started doing some interviews. And one of the employees there said, yeah, he found a something in the bed of his pickup truck but he threw it out. Um, he took it home, opened it up. There was a doll. There was some other stuff in there. And he didn't, they thought it was just some, some joke or prank, so he threw it away. He didn't take the garbage down to the end of the driveway. And law enforcement was able to recover that package. And during the course of the investigation, Home Depot was able to provide us with a video of the parking lot. And so we were able to see a vehicle come in, and that vehicle could be identified as a Jeep Cherokee or a similar type vehicle. That was important to us because that was information at that time that law enforcement knew, but he didn't know law enforcement knew. The police finally had sight of BTK, but with grainy, unclear CCTV footage, it was the smallest of clues. In an effort to keep himself hidden, BTK's communication methods were becoming increasingly complicated. The police and he start communicating through small ads in the Wichita Eagle. Finally, he asks the police in one of the communications, what if I were to give you a floppy disk with more details of the killings? Um, could you identify me? He asks us, you know, be honest, you know, because the police can't lie. Well, we can lie if we're catching a serial killer. And, and then he was told, you can send us whatever you want. We won't trace it. BTK sent a disc to the local TV station. The police took a look, and suddenly, with this one mistake, the case was blown wide open. We were contacted by KSAS Fox TV, and they had received a package. Um, they didn't initially recognize it as, as being from him, but then when they opened it up and saw the contents, which included the, the floppy disk, um, they called the police department. They called me and said, hey, we got a floppy disk. And I remember, and will never forget, being present when the disk was put into the computer and Randy Stone, the computer expert, went through the language on the disk, which is beyond me. You know, at the time, I'm sitting in a little cubicle, facing the laptop, doing a thing, and I look behind me, and there's like 
20 people all crowded around a semicircle around me. So it's one of those no pressure, don't screw this up type of things. So I imaged it and I opened up the image and started looking through it. And there's the file on there, test A. RTF, which was a Microsoft Office, or it's a Word document file. And then you see Dennis, and then more gibberish, and you see uh, Christ Lutheran Church. When you saw that, there was another detective sitting next to, to Randy, who then Googled the Christ Lutheran Church, and there up in the corner of their website was a picture of the president of the church, Dennis. I still get goosebumps remembering that because you're looking at that and going, that's him. Finally, the team had a suspect. Now they had to prove Dennis Rader was BTK. So then we were off and running. We learned that Rader had an address in Park City, and we went down the street that Rader was said to have lived on. You remember that little vehicle that was in the Home Depot parking lot? It was in Rader's driveway. At that point is when you knew, you know, you didn't know how this was going to end, but you knew we'd got him. And I made a phone call I didn't think I'd ever be able to make, but I called Kenny and I said, you know, we, we got him. But police still didn't have enough to make an arrest. They needed hard proof that Dennis Rader was the BTK killer. They have got no probable cause to demand a DNA sample from Rader, so they take the unlikely step of going to the hospital asking for a cervical smear that his daughter had given and comparing the DNA that they got from various crime scenes, the semen they'd found. And they find that it's extremely close. The match is in cream. Must be a family member. The police could finally move in. A large contingent of people <laughs> were sent toward Park City on uh, February the 25th of 2005, and at 12.15, he was taken into custody. Raider is finally arrested and is eventually charged with 10 murders, including the Oteros. The police had many crimes they suspected Raider and his alter ego BTK of committing. But at that time, only he knew the full extent of the truth. The interrogation was a delicate affair. We had broken up the case into several different sections, so we started to rotate in investigators, and he would be more than a year, and talked for almost 34 hours. And he almost saw himself as an instructor of, as he called it, uh, you know, the, the golden age of serial killing. When they're done with the interviews, I'm back from doing my search warrants. He's in the interview room, and they put the, the vest on him, and they're hooking him up with the shackles and belly chain and that kind of thing. I just kind of stuck my head in the door and said, um, it's nice to be able to put a face go along with the name that I found on the floppy disk. And he looks up and he's kind of got this, the shackles like that and looks up and says, oh, so you're the one, huh? And I said, yeah, I'm the one. So we uh, kind of joked back and forth. And he was, he was in good mood. He was joking and he said, oh, if I ever get out of here, I'm gonna have to find you and stuff your mouth full of a case of floppy disks. Finally, the infamous BTK was off the streets and in custody. So we, we took him over to the jail. Everybody in the holding cells and the area in there knew that it happened. The cells in there are all glassed off, and so all the inmates in there, they all come up to the glass, and they're looking at the glass, and then they start pounding on the glass, chanting his name, chanting, you know, pounding on the glass, and BTK, BTK. And then he's got a big old smile, and he's got his hands there, he goes, two thumbs up, as he's two thumbs up to everybody chanting his name. So, I mean, he just loved that. On the 1st of March 2005, Dennis Rader had been charged with the murders of the Otero family, Catherine Bright, Shirley Vian, Nancy Fox, Maureen Hedge, Vicky Wegerly, and Dolores E. Davis. When he first is charged and formally brought before a judge, he refuses to say anything, to plead. So the judge pleads not guilty for him. Rader says nothing. That was in March 2005. In June 2005, he's finally brought to trial. But before the trial properly begins, Rader changes his plea. So he did not necessarily want to have a hearing. He pled guilty to the murders, and he tried to avoid any type of hearing whatsoever. The district attorney thought uh, that it was very important 
that the community knows what happened. And the best way to do that is to have a public hearing. Because once it's a public hearing, then it's open. Now, the monster is really out of the bottle because Raider is perfectly prepared to accept that he's got away with it for 30 years and that he's going to go down in history as BTK. And what's more, he's going to make sure the world knows just how evil he was. During the hearing, Raider described the murders, showing little remorse and with no apology to the horror of viewers. Most of these sentencing hearings take a couple of hours. This one took three days. and. They would present evidence from the murders and really just kind of combine, this is what we had at the crime scene, this is what his confession says. And it was just to kind of confirm to the community, this is really him, this is what happened. And then you had an opportunity for the victims and their families to make a statement, and it was just truly heartbreaking and painful, but hopefully it helped them that finally, after all these years, the person that had murdered their loved one was, uh, was done, was going to prison. Raider was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum term of 175 years. He remains in solitary confinement where he will stay for the rest of his life. One of my favorite shots is uh, him being led into the uh, penitentiary over in El Dorado, Kansas. There is something about Radar that genuinely chills the soul. And something about that look in his eyes, I can never, ever get it out of my mind. That little smirk, that little glimmer of, I'm better than you. I really am God. I'm not only the devil, I am God as well. Dennis Radar crafted a depraved alter ego that terrified a whole generation but it was his own arrogance that would eventually be his undoing. For over 30 years, he was one of the world's most elusive criminals, taunting the police and teasing the press. He brutally murdered 10 people, including two children, by binding, torturing and killing them, all to fit his sick brand, BTK, and make him one of the world's most evil killers.